Good morning and welcome. This is Andy Bow from Governance Services. Under agenda item number one, Councillor Downs was nominated as chair prior to the meeting. Could I ask other members present if they're agreeable to this? Yes, that's fine. Yes, yes. Yeah. Right. Thank you. So that's Councillor Downs formally elected as chair for today. Can I pass over to you now? Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this remote hearing of the licensing subcommittee. My name is Councillor Downs, and I'll be chairing today's hearing. Before I proceed further, could I remind everyone that today's meeting is being streamed live on the City Council's YouTube channel. Before we commence, it has been noted that the agenda was only published four days prior to this hearing, as opposed to the usual five days. So can I have confirmation that all parties are agreeable to this? I will take your silence as approval. Could I ask the following members of the subcommittee to introduce themselves? So first of all, Councillor Christine Knight. Thank you, Chair. It's Councillor Christine Knight representing Wheatwood Ward. And Councillor Pat Latty. Oh, I was on mute. Councillor Pat Latty from Geisley and Rawdon Ward. Thank you. And just for completeness, I'm Councillor Rick Downs from Otley and Eden Ward. I'd like to start the hearing today by confirming that this meeting of the licensing subcommittee meets the requirements of the council's constitution, even though members of the panel are remote in remote attendance. While items today will be fully discussed as usual, remote attendance requires a few slight changes as to, as to how I will manage the debate. Therefore, can all attendees mute their microphone unless I invite them to speak? This will avoid disruption from background noise. Can all participants keep their cameras on during the hearing? All participants will be invited to introduce themselves at the start of the hearing to make it clear to public observers who will be involved in the proceedings. I ask for your assistance and patience while I go through this process. Could I now invite officers to introduce themselves and mute your microphone once you've introduced yourself? I'll start with Rob Brown. Good morning, I'm Robert Brown. I'm a solicitor and um, legal advisor to the uh, panel today. Uh, I'm from uh, Leeds City Council's Legal Services and I'm supported by my colleague and fellow solicitor, Philippa Murray. Thank you, Matthew Nelson. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Matthew, uh, part of Entertainment Licensing, and today I'm supported by Samantha Longfellow Pennicott uh, and the case officer for the application, Victoria Radford. Thank you. Thank you. And Andy Booth. Morning. Andy Booth from Governance Services, and I'll be the clerk to the subcommittee this morning. Thank you. Moving on to the agenda, could I ask the clerk to go through agenda items numbers two to five? Thank you, Chair. Under agenda item number two, there are no appeals against the refusal of inspection of documents. Under item number three, there are no exempt items which require the exclusion of the press or public. Under agenda item number four, there are no late items. There has been some supplementary information that has been published on the Council's website alongside the agenda and circulated to all parties. And under agenda item number five, could I ask members if they have any disclosable pecuniary interest to declare? None from me. No. No. Okay, back to you, okay. Chair. Thank you. And the, there were a couple of shakes of heads from my colleagues as well. Um, okay, so agenda item number six, application for the grant of a premises license for Mercure slots, Hare Hills Lane, Leeds. Could I ask the applicant and their representatives to introduce themselves, please? We'll start with uh, Mr. Philip Colvin, QC. Morning, Chair. Yes, I'm Philip Colvin. I'm a barrister representing the applicant. I'm instructed by Mr Richard Bradley of Popleston Allen Solicitors. And I've got with me Amanda Kiernan, who is the head of compliance for the applicant. Andy Tipple, who is the head of product. Chris Green, who is the expansion manager. Jill Clulo, who is the senior auditor and also Daryl Butterworth, who is an independent licensing and security uh, compliance consultant. Thank you. Next, uh, Dr. Richard Bradley, please. Hello, Chair, thank you. Uh, my name is Richard Bradley. I'm with 
Lister working with Popple Stanell and Solicitors on behalf of the applicant. Thank you. Um, Amanda Kiernan. Hello, I'm Amanda Kiernan, Head of Compliance for Merca Slots. Thank you. Andy Tipple. Sorry, delay on the unmute there. Hi there, Andy Tipple, Head of Product for Prosepi. Thank you. Jill Clulo. Hi, I'm Jill Clulo, the Senior Auditor with Prosepi. Thank you. And Chris Green. Morning, Chris Green. I'm the uh, UK Expansion Manager for Casino Gaming Limiteds. Thank you. Uh, could I ask the responsible authorities and objectors to introduce themselves? So we'll start with Susan Duckworth. Good morning, Chair. Yes, I'm Susan Duckworth and I'm representing the Licensing Authority. Sophia Ditter. Morning, I'm Sophia Ditter from the Financial Inclusion Team and I'm a witness for Susan Duckworth at the Licensing Thank you. Authority. Thank you. Joe Rowlands. Um, Joe Rowlands and Murta Elbers are, I, I'm, I'm, I'm represented on their behalf as well. Thank you. Okay. Mert Elbers. Sorry, that's me. I, I'm representing on behalf of Mert Elbers as well. Oh, sorry, I do <laughs> Yeah, right. Uh, Sergeant Frederick Winter. Yes, hello, it's uh, Fred Winster and I'm the um, Neighbourhood Policing Sergeant for the Gibson and Hare Hills Ward with West Yorkshire Police. Thank you and I apologise on my briefing note, it said Winter and I say it's Winster, my apologies. A common uh, mistake, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> uh, Councillor Denise Ragan. It's Councillor Denise Ragan, it's a bit like uh, Bouquet. Uh, I'm uh, Councillor Denise Reagan for uh, Bermondsoft and Richmond Hill, but I'm also the uh, Inner East Community Committee Chair. Good morning. And again, please accept my apologies for the mispronunciation of your name. Um, Christina Giorgio. Good morning. I'm Christina Giorgio. I'm representing the business on Hales Lane. Thank you. Donna Englefield. We're nearly there. Still on mute, I'm afraid. I can see that Donna's with us, but is struggling to get off of mute. Hi, can you hear me now? Yeah. Sorry, I'm new to this Zoom game. Um, I'm Donna Englefield. I am representing the residents of Bermondshoffs and Richmond Hill and the Noel Community um, Committee. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Salma Arif. Morning, everybody. I'm Councillor Salma Arif and I represent Gipton and Hare Hills. Thank you. And I'm just noting back, um, I've also, I'm also aware, and he's been mentioned, but Daryl Butterworth is also with us. I forgot to ask for him to introduce himself earlier. Yeah, good morning, Chair. My name is Daryl Butterworth. I'm an independent licensing consultant. Thank you. I think that's everybody. Is there anybody here who is down to speak? Um, Karen, um, do you want to just unmute yourself and introduce yourself? Hi, my name's Karen Harris. I'm a local resident and I'm representing residents of Hare Hills through Hare Hills Community Watch. Thank you, Karen. Is there anybody else? I can't see everybody on screen so um, because I'm operating from an iPad. So if there's anybody else that's down to speak, um, could you make yourself known now, please? No. OK, could the legal advisor to the subcommittee outline the procedure for the hearing, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> this is an application for a new bingo premises license uh, for premises at 377 to 379 Hare Hills Lane, Leeds, LS96AP, uh, to trade under the name of Merca Slots. Um, it's proposed by the subcommittee that the hearing will proceed as follows. Um, counsel for the applicant. Sorry, is there somebody got background noise there? Can you hear me OK? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Yeah. OK, sorry. Um, <clears throat> yes, counsel for the applicant to address the subcommittee first. Uh, the other parties in attendance who've indicated an intention to speak at the hearing will then address the subcommittee. 
Uh, and then the applicant's representative council will then have the opportunity to respond to anything said by the other parties. Um, it might be helpful at this stage to set a running order for the objectors. Um, and I was thinking of uh, suggesting the following order, uh, West Yorkshire Police to go first, the objectors, um, followed by the licensing authority, followed by uh, Councillor Reagan and Councillor Arif. Um, I understand that Councillor Reagan and Councillor Arif intend to call as witnesses uh, people who have also submitted representations in their own right, rather than exercising their right to address the committee as parties. Um, are there any, um, any other objectors who uh, intend to speak today? Karen Harris, are you appearing as a witness or are you intending to speak in your own right? I think you're on mute. I, I'm actually not honest. I did put in a, um, a submission, but I was asked at the last minute because of the change in dates and it meant that the person who was due to speak can't because they're working. I'm fortunate I've been able to take the morning off. So I'm basically, I was told I would speak in their place. Okay. But I don't know under what circumstance they were speaking. Who, who was it you were going to, um, you're speaking in place of? There was a, a gentleman called Ben Greaves. Ah, oh, right. Um, didn't see him on the list of uh, intended speakers. If I may come in, I believe I mm. would call in uh, Karen um, as, as part of the witness as a resident. OK, are you happy with that, Karen? Um, you, you, if you've put in a, a representation, you would have the right to speak. No, I'm, your... I'm happy to do it either way as a witness or, or as a representation, so I'm, I don't mind. Well... Uh, we better decide now, I suppose. Well, I don't um, know what, what the difference be. I mean, I've gone through the 400 odd extra pages of submission. If you're if you're called as a witness, then you'll you'll be included in the time allocation of Councillor Arif, um, because a limit will be put on each speaker. Um, whereas if you wanted to speak in your own right, then you would have your own uh, time allocation. I'll speak in my own right then, because uh, okay. having gone through the 200 odd pages, I don't know that I could do it in a minute. Uh, it wouldn't be a minute, <laughs> but uh, we're going to come to that, to, to the uh, time allocations um, uh, shortly, actually. Okay, thank you very much for that. So you'll probably speak either as a witness or in your own right, but probably you think in your own right. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, in making its determination, the subcommittee will consider what's appropriate and proportionate to promote the licensing objectives, uh, namely a, the prevent, preventing gambling from being a source of crime or disorder, being associated with crime or disorder or being used to support crime, b, ensuring that gambling is conducted in a fair and open way, and c, protecting children and other vulnerable persons from being harmed or exploited by gambling. Um, the subcommittee would generally set a time limit on presentations um, and on the basis that it would provide the same time limit to all parties. Um, now, I, I think the usual time limit we have for um, uh, uh, premises licenses is 15 minutes per party, but I suspect that, um, uh, Mr. Colvin, do, do you have any um, idea of how long you would wish to speak for? I'm really conscientious in obeying the rules of the subcommittees that I appear in front of. So I was told 15 minutes. Um, I therefore planned for this morning by putting in a skeleton argument yesterday, which I hope the subcommittees had the benefit of. Uh, and if they have, then I, I hope I'll be able to stay to the time limit which you've set. OK, uh, that would include your initial address and uh, responding to um, or summing up, if I put it that way. Yes. I mean, I, I, I think given there's quite a lot of information here. <laughs> Um, if you if you did wish to ask for longer, I appreciate you've said that you prepared for 15 minutes. If you wanted to, to factor in a, a little bit of uh, um, leeway there, then uh, I think you could certainly put that to, to the would it Would it be easier to um, say 15 minutes initially, um, objectors to have 20 minutes and then a five minute um, um, back to uh, the to. Um, uh, Mr. Colvin, so that he can then sum up based on, the, uh, you know, and address the issues that the um, uh, objectors have put. Would that be better? 
don't know whether I might check, sir. I mean, I mean essentially, I'm going to speak for about 10 minutes at the beginning, and I'd planned to sum up very, very quickly in five minutes or so. But inevitably, when there's a number of people who want to speak, uh, I'm not going to be interrupting them, but they're almost sure to raise things which I'm going to need to deal with, but I'm not going to know how I'm going to deal with them until I hear it. So will I just have a little bit of extra time just to be able to deal with new points which have arisen during the course of all the oral, oral addresses you're about to hear? Would that come out of my 15 minutes or might I have a little bit of time on top? Because of the number of objectors, would it be possible, uh, Robert, to say, um, allow 10 minutes um, for the initial presentation, objectors to have 15 and, uh, sorry, 20, and then um, a further 10 for addressing uh, the points raised? Is that permissible? Well, it's, it's entirely up to you, Chair yes. and, and committee members, but uh, I, I suppose I should just um, canvas the views of um, the other speakers. Do, do any of the uh, objectors think that they would need longer than uh, 20 minutes uh, can i just can i just ask robert is that 20 minutes for the whole of the objectors and the witnesses as well sorry no it's tw it's 20 minutes per per party so that, that that's why i was uh, oh, that's fine, to karen yeah but, uh, you need no, to get 20 minutes my, my point was to ensure that both sides had equal time which is something that we always ensure occurs but I'm mindful of the fact that there are a number of objectors and I wanted to give Mr Colvin the opportunity to address those objections and five minutes may not be sufficient. So that's why I was increasing his time to 20. But in doing so, I would then, although they almost certainly will not need it by the sounds of it, uh, allow objectors up to 20 minutes themselves just for uh, parity. Yeah. OK, as long as the objectors are also aware that the... the the time that includes the witnesses that they're calling so that, that if their witnesses speak for for, for 10 minutes then uh, well, that, that, that is the other factor of course, the, because yeah. under each one we have several witnesses so it does actually extend that time out to allow them to have that as well well it would be, i was i was um suggesting that that, that would be within their 20 minutes they, they would choose to call a witness to give evidence they don't get the witnesses time uh on top that's no, why that's i said to, to karen, karen that um if she wished to address the committee in her own right as an objector then she would get the same time allocation 20 minutes rather than just being included in council arif's time yeah so uh, all objectors understand that that, that, you, that your witnesses would be included in your 20 minutes yeah and you're still happy with that and are we happy therefore to allow um 10 minutes for presentation of case and 10 minutes for addressing objectors concerns yeah, yes, I think perhaps Mr. Colvin might. It's, it's up to him if he, was, if he wants to speak for a little longer than 10 minutes initially. If he spends 12 minutes or 15 minutes and five minutes, it's up to him uh, as long as he appears, you know, perhaps we'll leave it for him to, to make sure he's got his stopwatch running. Well, that's what I'm saying to give 20 minutes overall rather than 15. Yeah, yeah, okay. I'm really grateful. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Um, right, so 20 minutes per party. Um, after each presentation, the subcommittee members may wish to ask questions. The time for questions to be asked and answered is in addition to the time limit set for presentations. Uh, please note, we do not permit cross-examination in subcommittee as a rule. If any party feels there is a, a crucial question that needs to be asked and answered, please do not ask the person directly, but instead make a request to the chair who will determine whether or not the question should be put. Uh, parties may request permission to call witnesses. As we've already discussed, several of the parties have already indicated that they will be doing so. Um, all documents that have previously been submitted have been copied and circulated to the subcommittee in advance. Um, you should all have the same original papers consisting of a main agenda pack bundle numbered to 460. Uh, and I understand that the parties have also been provided with a copy of um, Mr. Colvin's skeleton argument. Um, it would be helpful when referring to documents to identify which document you're referring to by its bundle page number. Uh, additional documents may now only be tabled with the consent of all parties. Are there any other documents which any party wishes to refer to? Good, thank you. Um, please note that your presentation is your opportunity to address the subcommittee, so you should try to include everything that you wish the committee to take into account. After the parties have made their presentations and after any questions, the subcommittee members will go into a private session. If members have any additional questions to ask, they will return to the meeting to ask those questions. They'll then return to the private session to make their decision. Um, can all parties please remain in the meeting until they're asked to leave? 
Um, all the parties will be informed once the hearing has ended and then will be advised of the decision in writing within five working days from tomorrow. Uh, can I ask if there are any questions or representations about the, pro the uh, procedure we propose to follow? Nope. Right. Thank you, Chair. Okay, can we now uh, hear from the, uh, the application from the entertainment licensing, please? Yeah, of course. Thank you, Chair. So members are today asked to consider an application for a new bingo premises license for the premises at 377 to 379 Arrows Lane, Leeds, LS9. The premises is trading under the name Merca Slots. Uh, the application has been made by Casino Gamo, uh, sorry, Gaming Limited, uh, and a copy of the application can be found at Appendix A on page 15 of the report. A plan showing the extent of the licensed premises and the proposed internal layout has been circulated to the licensing subcommittee members by email in advance of this hearing. <clears throat> Uh, in accordance with the Gambling Commission's licence conditions and codes of practice, it is a requirement for all licensees, except for those which hold a trap betting licence, to provide a local area risk assessment <clears throat> to identify and address the local risk presented by the provision of, uh, of gambling facilities. A copy of the local risk assessment and an additional bundle provided by the applicant to support the application can be found at Appendix C, starting on page 23 of the report. The application has attracted representations from the licensing authority and from West Yorkshire Police, both in their capacities as responsible authorities. A copy of the representation raised by the licensing authority, including further information supporting the representation, can be found at Appendix D on page 323 of the report. The representation raised by West Yorkshire Police is on this occasion provided by the sergeant of the local neighbourhood policing team and the copy can be viewed on page 331 at Appendix E. On behalf of interested parties, the application has attracted a joint representation from the local ward councillors of Gipton and Errols and Bermontop and Richmond Hill wards, as the applying premises lies close to the boundary of both constituencies. Uh, additionally, the licensing authority is in receipt of a total of 14 individual letters of representation for local residents, expressing concerns primarily on the grounds of protecting children and vulnerable persons. The representations by the ward members and local residents are numbered 1 to 15 at Appendix F of the Agenda Pack, which starts on page 335. Uh, finally, to help inform the application process and to aid members' deliberations, the July 2020 edition of the Gambling Commission's Code of Practice can be found at Appendix G on page 377. The mandatory and default conditions of which the applicant does not propose to exclude any default condition from the operating schedule can be found at Appendix H on page 459 of the report. And the gaming machine limits in respect of a bingo premises license can be noted at point 11 of the report. And that, Chair, is the application. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, could I now invite the applicant to present the application? Thank you very much indeed, Chair. Uh, Councillors, I'd like to start by coming straight to the point and acknowledging that this application is made in a deprived area. I want to assure the subcommittee that my client has given conscientious consideration to the concerns expressed and as is expected of it by the Gambling Commission and by your policy, has conducted a detailed local area risk assessment and in response proposed a set of conditions which would make this the most conditioned licence in its whole national estate. Uh, we've put in, as you know, an extensive bundle of evidence and a long skeleton argument which I hope was helpful in conveying our case to all those present. We will be inviting you to accept two main things. Firstly, that this is a professional and diligent operator. And secondly, that the measures it has proposed represent a proper response to the issues identified so as to protect the relevant licensing objectives. And I'm going to spend 10 minutes or so speaking to those two points. First of all, the applicant. My client is one of the most experienced and largest operators of gaming on the high street in the UK. It's operating about 180 premises currently. 
And it's a fact that it has been granted licenses in all of the premises it has applied for, including in deprived areas. This is not because it has sidelined local concerns con relating to gambling or ignored them, but because it has addressed them and continues to address them after it has opened. Strikingly, it has never suffered a review, despite operating in a number of challenging areas. That is because it works hard to promote the licensing objectives, is respect respectful and protective of its local community, forms good liaisons with local police and other agencies, and responds promptly and professionally to any issues which arise. Its board is committed to the promotion of the licensing objectives, including by developing new methods of protection of vulnerable people at industry and company level. The company leaves nothing to chance. It has well-established and competent operational processes and staff training systems, full details of which we've provided to you. And we've also described them in the statements of the highly experienced witnesses who lead the applicant's compliance function. Local staff receive six weeks of induction to ensure that they are competent and confident to carry out the obligations placed upon them, and then biannual refresher training, which of course takes account of locational considerations. The company oversees compliance through its area management, its compliance auditors, its mystery shoppers and test purchasers, and also through national oversight and analysis of individual venue activity. If issues are identified from any sort, they are of course acted upon immediately. Now, all of this is extensively set out in the material. And I do not believe that the company's commitment, its systems, its training, compliance oversight, or its performance are being questioned by anybody, as indeed they've not been questioned in any of its other applications. The difference here is that rather than just resting on its credentials, and of course the legal obligations which are placed on it through the license conditions and codes of practice and mandatory and default conditions, Following its risk assessment, it has come forward with a bank of 35 well-considered conditions. This would make it the longest license in its estate if it were to be granted. Its other five premises in Leeds, which trade without regulatory concern, have no individual conditions whatsoever. The licensing objectives. Now, will my client's premises be a source of crime and disorder? The answer is no. We can say that with confidence because of my client's track record and because of the reason for that track record. In this respect, the applicant's premises are completely unlike betting officers, as our witnesses with their combined experience of more than a century all testify. Why is this? Well, the demographic to start with is 50% female. The surroundings are comfortable. Free tea and coffee and snacks are given out. Staff are not stuck behind a counter, but they walk the premises to supervise and chat to customers. The numbers attending at once are very low, usually a handful. Players come in, usually alone or perhaps in couples. They play the machines for a while, have a cup of tea, and then they wander out again. No alcohol is served or permitted. Staff are trained to actively monitor the exterior and CCTV is deployed inside and out. Any incidents are logged and reviewed at a senior level and reporting lines are established with local police teams. If anything untoward ever happens, it's dealt with. You just don't get loitering or street drinking or disorder outside. And I can say that anybody is free to visit any of the premises in my client's estate to confirm that if they so wish. So when there's a local objection which starts, there are street drinkers and disorder outside our betting offices, my client is able to say, we know, and it won't happen outside our premises. If it does, review us. 
And I say that here too, and I say it with conviction. Children, as a matter of law, children are permitted into bingo establishments, provided that they don't play the higher category machines. Now my client goes much, much further. Children are not admitted at all. They can't even see in. Uh, so they can't watch gambling taking place, even though they can in many other premises, including many in Hare Hills itself. There's no exterior advertising attractive to them. Challenge 25 is strictly applied and notices to that effect are placed on the facade. We are therefore more than confident that children are protected from being harmed by gambling. The residual idea advanced by one or two objectors, the children must be protected from even knowing that they're walking past a gambling establishment does not represent the law or national or indeed your local policy. Vulnerable people. The point made is that the local population probably comprises a higher than average number of vulnerable gamblers. And we do not contest that. What my client has tried to show is that its proposals in this case represent a reasonable and proportionate response. Firstly, its staff training systems, including in relation to behavior recognition, customer interaction and self-exclusion, are not only approved by the Gambling Commission, but are also approved by GAMCARE and are internationally accredited. Secondly, it continues to lead on the topic through its work at industry level on responsible gambling messaging, uh, which it has developed in concert with GAMCARE and which it has now rolled out on all of its uh, machines and tickets, but also at company level with the Young Gamers and Gamblers Education Trust to develop additional training for management staff. Thirdly, it employs the Playwright app to enable players to set limits on their own gambling behaviour and staff to intervene if limits are breached. Fourthly, customer interactions are electronically recorded and are then regularly reviewed by the compliance team to ensure that all staff are complying with company processes. Fifthly, the company employs auditors to check on venue performance in relation to vulnerability and to test staff's knowledge about licensing objectives and their role. Sixthly, the company not only submits regulatory returns to the Gambling Commission detailing its performance, but it also makes an annual assurance statement to the Commission at board level to demonstrate the effectiveness of its risk management arrangements. Seventhly, the ban on alcohol uh, speaks for itself. Alcohol is not banned in bingo premises. Uh, it's banned in my client's bingo premises on the high street. Eighthly, it will train staff in local issues and invite the licensing authority and police to participate in that training if they wish. Ninthly, it will both inform customers regarding the identity of local care providers and liaise with the care providers themselves. Tenthly, it will ensure that its advice and support information are also given in languages appropriate to the area, given the diversity of the local population. And eleventh, uh, and of course, my client has offered closure from midnight to 9 a.m., so that there's a cutoff point for gambling every day. And all of those matters are dealt with in the evidence and skeleton. To conclude, neither the Act, nor the guidance, nor your policy, nor even Leeds City Council's commissioned research says that licenses should actually be refused in deprived areas. Far less does it name areas where licenses should be refused. There is no such thing as a gambling community, uh, community of impact policy nationally or in Leeds, no presumption against licensing. Rather, as you have been advised, there is an aim to permit, which as the books say, means applying conditions to seek solutions to issues rather than preventing altogether. And that's what my client has sought to do. 
Now, if there are matters we've not thought of by way of conditions, we would be more than pleased to discuss them. This is not a pass-fail test. And I hope that if there are still concerns, we can see in the discussion whether there is a way to overcome them. Thank you very much indeed for listening to me. Thank you. Um, does the subcommittee have any questions to the applicant? I, I have a few questions, but I don't know whether you want me to ask yes, them now. Fire away, right. Christine. Okay, right, thank you. Um, okay, so first of all, in, in the skeleton argument, top of page six, um, it refers to customer demographics being in the older age bracket. But in the um, risk assessment that Mercosots have carried out, it states that the age group of this particular area is mostly age 30 to 59. So it doesn't suggest that this area um, falls into the age group that, uh, that, that Mercosots would normally expect to be the age group of their customers. Um, given that, and given the fact that um, over 50% of the population in the area are on low incomes, 77% of them unemployed. Um, what is the business rationale behind choosing this particular area over a more affluent area? Also, given the fact that the research that's been conducted has suggested that, and this is on page 327 of the pack, there are certain groups that are more vulnerable to gambling related harm and there's a list of, of uh, groups there and all those groups are known to be in this particular area so uh, please could you explain what the business rationale is behind choosing an area of deprivation as opposed to a more affluent area an area of deprivation where it's known that there are a, a number of people that are, fall into the more vulnerable groups um, that can suffer harm from, from gambling. That's my first question. Um, my next question is in relation to the protection of children. And I appreciate that um, comments have been made about how to protect children from, from entering, they're not allowed to enter the, the, the premises and they're not allowed to engage in, in gambling. But is, given what I've, I've said about the demographics of this particular area and the fact that over 57% of the children in the area are already in poverty, what will Mercoslots do to protect the children of the people who are losing money in, in, in the bingo hall, if indeed they are losing money? Because, uh, and also, has any, have Mercoslots conducted any research into the overall loss and gains of their customers? So how many of them actually win and how overall over a certain period of time and how many and how many lose. Um, I'd also like to know if there is a cap on a customer loss per session. Is there anything in place that prevents customers from losing more than a particular amount? Does Mercus Slots offer credit to customers? And if it's uh, if it does, what protections are in place to ensure the credit is affordable to them, to the customer? Um, and did I have another one? Oh, yeah. So also on page seven of the skeleton argument, it states that if the customer is showing signs of problematic of problem gambling, then obviously the support offered. But what I'd like to know is what criteria is used to determine what should be considered as problem gambling um, and how you would um, recognise that. OK, I think I think that's all my questions. Thank you. Okay. I think I was on mute throughout all of that. That's quite, it's quite, <laughs> it's quite a list, Ken. So let's work through that list, and uh, I'll do my very best to uh, uh, answer those questions properly. Um, just so far as um, the age is concerned, I think what my client was trying to convey um, is that gambling uh, in these high street bingo establishments is largely more attractive uh, to an older demographic around about 50% of which uh, is female. So it's not, it's not really attractive um, to a much younger demographic. Um, I, I'm not sure whether 
uh, my client in its risk assessment has taken the view that its age demographic is going to be different here from anywhere else. But maybe I could ask one of those who were involved in the risk assessment to see whether they can come in on that point. Maybe we could ask Jill Clulo perhaps to come in and just talk about the the age demographic in in Casino generally and, and here in Leeds? Well, yeah, obviously in um, this area, as you said, in, in the risk assessment I uh, compiled, majority of the people in the Hare Hills area are between, aged between 30 and 59. But what we were trying to say in our argument, the majority of our customers are, not, are at the higher end of that uh, spectrum rather than the lower end. I don't think there was a conflict in what we were saying. I'd, I'd rather assume that might be the case. Yeah. Um, now, so far as um, where these applications go, obviously my client uh, makes applications where there are available premises and where it can find a business case for the premises to go. Um, I'm just going to just respectfully say, councillor, that... Um, the, the question of demand for the premises, the question of the business case, is dealt with under section 153, um, and it's, it's not a matter which is either relevant um, to the subcommittee or which the subcommittee can, can explore. Um, but it, it would be fair to say that um, in Leeds as a whole, there's probably an under-provision um, of bingo, uh, the ratio of um, bingo to um, betting officers or betting officers to bingo nationally is, is about 11 to 1. Whereas in Leeds, uh, I think on the last data I saw, there were about 105 betting officers um, and five bingo establishments. And so it's, it's pretty clear that in Leeds, there, there, there is some demand for bingo to happen. But what my client does is it looks for areas where it feels there may be demand. It looks for premises where the rent is acceptable um, and it makes applications and it has to apply for planning, which has been granted here. And, and then it applies for the license. But the exact demand question uh, is not one which um, can really be placed in front of the sub in front of the subcommittee. Um, and I think it's probably just worth trying to reiterate um, this this point that um, in under the Gambling Act, the discretion is rather narrower than it is under the Licensing Act. And it's certainly uh, much narrower than it is under the, the Town and Country Planning Act, because um, when it comes to planning, you can look at all of these broad questions, whereas under Section 153 of the Gambling Act, and our evidence is, is very much structured that way, um, there's an aim to permit, provided that you've dealt with the risks which are set out in, in the codes of practice and so forth, and, and that's how this has been presented. Uh, the second question, uh, councillor, was in relation to um, the protection of children from harm and what that means um, in the license conditions and codes of practice um, and in the Gambling Commission's guidance um, and also indeed in your policy um, is protection from being harmed or exploited by gambling. Uh, and that is generally taken to mean and means in Leeds um, from being harmed um, both by playing and also in the way that they are exposed to gambling. And so, for example, um, it's, it's, it's legal to allow children into bingo establishments. Um, the Act says that. It's, it's legal to allow them into um, family entertainment centres, which are seaside arcades. It's legal to allow them into pubs where there are Category C gaming machines, which are replicated by 80% of the machines um, in my client's own premises. Um, and, and so the, the, the obligation is to stop them gambling and is also to stop them witnessing advertising um, which would induce them to gamble. Um, and so there's rules about um, what it is that you can promote and how you can promote it in a way which is visible to children. Um, but then when it comes to adults, again, uh, the way the legislation is framed is that there's an aim to permit. So Parliament is seeing gambling as a legitimate activity, but is trying to make sure 
that people who are vulnerable don't gamble more than they want to, more than they can afford to, and also that people who are um, affected either permanently because of some mental um, disability or also temporarily through their exposure to alcohol or drugs uh, are not gambling um, because they would obviously um, be vulnerable. So this, this, this question, Council, which you raise is answered by the measures which my client puts in place to, um, to protect vulnerable people um, from being harmed uh, or uh, exploited by gambling. So far as um, win, loss and so forth, the way this is dealt with uh, varies according to the type of gambling establishment which you have. Leeds City Council decided that it wanted to pitch to have the large casino uh, in Leeds where you can go in and gamble uh, effectively as much as you want. Um, Leeds has over a hundred betting offices where you can go and put bets on as, as much as you like uh, and so forth. But when it comes to um, bingo, uh, there are really two ways to gamble uh, in a casino gambling establishment. You can gamble on machines um, whose stake and prize limit um, is governed by legislation. So there are uh, rules set out in regulations as to what the stake and prize limits are for machines. And there's also rules about the allocation of machines between higher and lower stakes, which Parliament has thought through very carefully and is the endless topic of debate, in which 80% of machines uh, have to be category C or D, which are uh, quite low level gambling of the sort that you find in pubs. And only 20% can be what are called category B3, uh, which are the same level uh, as are allowed uh, in the four uh, machines which are allowed in each uh, of the licensed betting offices, uh, which you have locally. So in that way, Parliament is trying to uh, uh, literally set a maximum on how much people can lose per spin. My client's experience um, is that the average stake made by customers is in the region 30 to 40p um, from recollection. Um, and then in addition to the machines, there are a series of bingo games which are played on tablet uh, my client's experience being that even in the large flat floor bingo halls, the sort that you and I may have grown up with, and in fact, which my first job was in, um, pe although they're given paper tickets, people prefer now these days to play on these electronic tablets. There's electronic tablets uh, and th the, the limits on those tablets are set out in the papers, but they go down to 10p. So people want to play for, for literally for, for coppers. Um, then they can do that as well. So I would say that in comparison to what, what might routinely be gambled in a betting office or in a casino, this is reasonably low level gambling. It's not penny fall stuff, it's commercial gambling and that's why it needs a license and that's, that's why um, there's all these protections set out. So far as um, credit is concerned, now you can't grant credit um, in a um, in a bingo establishment. Nobody can come in and say, "I'm getting paid Monday. Can you can you credit me up with twenty quid?" That 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 just doesn't um, happen. So far as um, customer losses um, per session are concerned, the way this works, and if I can just sort of elide that with um, your third question, you could get somebody who could go into a betting office and gamble with quite a lot of money, or indeed a bingo assumption, gamble with a, quite a lot of money, and it wouldn't be doing them any harm at all. You can get somebody who go in and bet £10 in a betting office, and what they've bet, in fact, is their dinner money. So it's not, it's not actually about the, the simply the sum which is being bet. Instead, the way the Gambling Commission looks at this and uh, publishes guidance on this called customer interaction. And then the way this is then um, uh, cascaded down into premises establishment through the accredited training that I've talked about, which is internationally and nationally accredited, is that, is that staff are there to recognize particular gambling behaviors, which are indicative of problem gambling. 
Uh, and those things might be, for example, repeat trips to uh, an ATM. It might be trying to borrow money from people. It might be signs of frustration, literally behavioral signs. It might mean an escalation in the amount of money which is being gambled, gambling with 50 Ps in the beginning, but within a few minutes gambling with five pounds. And one of the good things about my client staff who tend to be local and know their local customers is they understand the patterns and they can see that somebody who yesterday was gambling for pounds is now gambling for two pounds and is there longer than normal and is becoming frustrated. So that is why the fact that my client staff walk the floor and it's a floor which usually has two, three, four or five people on it. They can see what is going on. And you do not get prizes in my client's establishment for not intervening. You sometimes read about how betting companies almost induce people to bet more and bet larger. My client awards no prizes for that at all. It's exactly the opposite. If it's seen that my client is not intervening because the auditors are seeing from the data which has to be entered on the smart tab, uh, that, uh, that of the number of interventions and their outcomes, that triggers audit, that triggers management intervention, because interventions are not ha happening uh, at the level uh, which uh, should be expected. So coming here, my client staff will have drummed into them that this is an area with, an, with a higher than average number of vulnerable people and will set out in its training and its operation, its management and its audit to ensure that my client is reflecting that in its processes and in the way that it interacts with people. Now that's from me, um, but it may be that one of my uh, witnesses, Amanda or Jill, who've worked in premises and also audit premises, uh, can can help on that question about behavioural indicators. Can sorry, just leave the floor open to them to come in if they if they feel they might be helpful. Hi. Yes. Yeah. Just sort of back up there with um, what Philip has sort of responded there. Um, we do we we put a lot of emphasis on training our employees um you know for their benefit as well as our customers so that they're comfortable working in these environments and they're comfortable approaching these customers interacting with them um and i would like to say that we do know our customers you know people do they do know, know the local area um my team of watch jill is one of them is the audit team which regularly visit the venues and we will challenge the employees on how they're managing their customers how they're interacting with them and also remotely we collect all of this data which records customer interactions um, and we we share that with the operations team so that the operational managers the area managers that look after these venues can go down go to, to these managers and their employees and discuss with them how they're doing their customer interactions and if we identify any shortfalls any lacks in tr lacking training um, we will address them with our learning and development team so um, I feel we have a very comprehensive support structure for uh, all of our employees throughout the whole of the um, all of the venues not the whole of the group so I hope that helps a little. Can I just round that off with one further point, which is something which is not required by law or guidance or the license conditions and codes of practice or anything else, which is the Playwright app, which allows customers to set limits on their gambling uh, and also alert staff when <clears throat> customers are gambling at times where they said they didn't want to. So my, my client is trying to equip um, people who come into its premises with the ability to preset limits uh, and then uh, enable staff if the if the customer sets the app in that way to intervene um, if those limits are, are are not being observed. So my client doesn't take any sort of great pleasure uh, in trying to get people to gamble beyond their limits. It much prefers uh, and sets out its its operation to ensure that this is just a leisure activity. It's no different from going into a pub and having a drink. It's just a leisure activity, a way to pass some time. It's not investment. The customer knows that the machines are set to provide a return, um, but that uh, on average, if you gamble, you are going to lose. Uh, nobody hides that. It's just a pastime. You hope you're going to win and walk out with a few pounds, but it's not a way to get rich. You're not going to do it. And my client doesn't pretend otherwise to anybody. Okay, Councillor Knight, does that answer your uh, questions? 
Not, in, not entirely, but that's that, that, uh, Is that's there anything fine. you'd like to put back at this point, no? No, like? no. no. Okay, thank you. No, thank um, you. Councillor Latty, have you any questions you'd like to put to the uh, applicant? Yes, just one, um, which is probably just a personal thing. I am a children's champion, obviously uh, do a lot with children. And my worry is perhaps the children's life might be affected by their parents gambling. So that's my worry um, that I'd like to put before you. Okay. And councillor, I, I completely understand the concern. You're, you're not the first person who've said that. Uh, and I don't want to appear sort of cynical or dismissive um, about the concern. Um, we're, we're all working within the system which there is. Um, I could say the same to you um, about parents drinking. Um, I could say the same to you about parents going into a casino. But if my client were not wanting to open this establishment, I could say the same to you about gambling online. And frankly, I would much rather that my mum or dad went into a friendly local premises with staff in uniform who were supervising their activity and willing to intervene than my mum or dad went online sitting on the sofa where that human interaction did not take place at all. Different countries deal with risk in a different way, whether that's speeding or whether it's alcohol, whether it's fatty foods or whether it's drugs and so forth. But in our country, Parliament has seen gambling as a legitimate high street activity. But what it's asked is that operators understand local risk and put in place measures to respond to that risk. So I, I totally understand that if, if you've got a family where the, the parents have chosen to spend too much money on one sort of activity or the other, that is a difficult circumstance for the children. And what you can expect of operators is that they take all reasonable measures to ensure that people do not gamble more than they want to or more than they can more than they can afford to. Um, but for most people, even in Hare Hills, gambling is just a pleasant leisure activity. It's just a way of passing some time. Uh, and so what you need to do is put in place systems to protect people who don't have that advantage, but who are vulnerable. And that's what my client has tried to do really assiduously in this case with conditions which go miles beyond. Well, its other five premises have none. The other eight premises in Hare Hills, I can guarantee you, will have none. My client will swing in here with a sort of code of practice, which I hope could be disseminated out in Hare Hills and would represent better protection for everybody but it would certainly be the best protection of any premises in Leeds. Thank you. Okay I have one question um, on page 25 of the uh, pack um, which is page 3 of 17 of the uh, the submission where we've got uh, it's about the um, age verification. Um, yeah. Now you've said that your client um, is going to ensure that um, under underage people don't get, get into the premise. Um, how exactly does that work? Because we've got here, it says that they uh, adopt a Think 25 policy and it says age verification checks are carried out and recorded. Any person unable or unwilling to verify their age with appropriate ID will be told to leave. If they've managed to play the machines, their state money will be returned to them. So two questions arise from that. One is that means that a young person could enter the premise, uh, in theory, get to a machine and in theory start uh, to gamble um, because there is no, it would appear there's no check before they get in. Um, and then how do you ascertain how much state money to return? Should that be the case? Um, it's a fair question, uh, Councillor. I, I think the, the, uh, the answer I want to give you is that I think it's about 10,000 betting officers in this country. Um, and when you walk into a betting office, you're not a, a greeted within a couple of metres by somebody in a uniform saying, oh, can I just check your age? The staff member will be behind the counter. Um, and if somebody to walk, were to walk in at race time, the staff member will have their head down taking or paying out bets. Um, gambling establishments in this country, with the exception of casinos, um, do not have 
um, door staff on the door, literally preventing anybody walking in. Um, but my client's experience is that uh, the number of children who want to come in is vanishingly small. Uh, and if they get in, they will be challenged um, pretty well immediately. Uh, my client writes down that if they've succeeded in playing the machines, um, that money will be returned. But this is not something which happens routinely. Uh, it is something which happens vanishingly rarely um, in my client's um, experience of operating these establishments. These establishments just aren't attractive to children at all. As soon as you walk in, you will stick out like a sore thumb. Um, so far as how much would be returned in theory, all the machines obviously are connected um, to the counter by a computer. So if in theory a child were able to get in, the CCTV, you would easily be able to show the client that the, the child had started gambling at 10.08 and had been challenged at 10.09, and you'd be able to see how much money they'd put into the machine in that minute. But I really do have to stress that this is some, not something which, which um, is, is, is actually happening in my client's premises. It's just a system to ensure that were it to happen, that it's properly dealt with. OK, just to come back to you then. So um, what you're saying is the key reason why young people wouldn't come in is because they wouldn't want to come in because it's not an establishment that would appeal to them. Um, but um, in fairness, um, they could go into a, a betting shop or something like that um, before being challenged um, because there is nobody on the door. Is there anything that your client would like to do to ensure that um, this policy, that your policy to not allow young people in is um, addressed so that it can't, they can't get to a machine? Is that something that you can address? Um, or are you simply saying that in your experience, it's not going to happen. So there's no point in doing anything other than waiting for people to come in and challenging them should they should they uh, appear to be under the age of 25. OK, it's a fair question. I mean, can I just say also a pub, um, also a motorway service station? Uh, I mean, all of those places are places where children can go in actually legally and then sidle over to a machine and gamble. Whereas in, in my client's premises, there's big notice on the door saying you can't get in legally. I think what I'd, I, I don't want, again, I don't want you to think that my client is just being dismissive about this. Um, but if I can tell you how much of a problem this is nationally, my client doesn't have a door supervision condition on any of its 180 premises nationally. Um, not one. Um, and uh, Mr. Butterworth, who's uh, produced a report, has explained he, he spent his whole life in a, a severely deprived area, which is Rochdale, where my client has traded for 30 years without concern. So the, the answer I'd like to give you is that if uh, there were a concern arising once it had opened that its ordinary procedures were not being effective, then my client is going to jump all over that because it does not want children in its premises uh, at all, let alone gambling. So my client would, would it's risk assessed at the beginning, if when it opens, there's a, there is actually a problem, then it will instantly risk assess again and work with the authorities to put in place the next measure, which might include, I don't know what, some further provision when the schools are closing and kids are walking by, I don't know. Um, what you could do, and my client would certainly be amenable to, is a condition which uh, included specific risk assessment and monitoring in relation to whether children are coming in when it opens. So that there's a, a process or a mechanism whereby my client has to specifically report on that to the licensing authority upon opening so that it can see whether this fear, which hasn't materialized elsewhere, materializes here. If, as we proceed through this hearing now or after you've discussed for a few minutes at, at the end, you feel that there needs to be a sort of further offer on this topic, then I'll be glad to sit down with my clients and discuss it. We don't get the sort of coffee breaks in the same sort of way, but I would be happy to sit down with my client for five minutes and discuss whether there's anything more which we which we could offer to put minds to rest on this point. Okay, thank you. Anything further from my colleagues on the panel? 
Right, OK. So we will now move on to the objectors to present their case. And so if I could ask West Yorkshire Police to um, lead the way, please. Yes, good morning. Uh, as I said earlier, my name is Fred Winster. I'm the Neighbourhood Police in Sergeant uh, and I work in a, uh, an area called Inner East, which covers Bermontoff and Richmond Hill Ward area, which is uh, where the proposed site is. Uh, and it's just on the border with Gibson Air Hills Ward, which I'm the lead sergeant for. <clears throat> um, in essence, my role is to um, deal with local problems that are long term in relation to policing um, and to engage with the community. So over the past two, almost two years, I've built up a good understanding of the local areas uh, and the problems that exist in them. Um, do object to the uh, proposed site and the granting of a license, um, primarily on the grounds that it'll uh, increase crime and disorder in the local area. Um, I carried out an analysis of um, crime relating to local uh, gambling establishments, which are already present. Uh, and there are four, which I know of, within a fifth of a mile of the proposed site. Um, and they have all experienced a high level of demand, or what I regard as a high level of demand. Um, Specifically, I, I, I look through all the calls and I've stripped out ones that don't relate to the premises, so fights outside, um, and just dealt with crimes and antisocial behaviour which have been reported within those gambling establishments. Uh, one store had six, uh, sorry, I should clarify that these, um, I did the analysis on the 25th of August, um, so it is slightly out of date. Uh, one store had 16 calls, second 27, and a third had 11 calls, and a fourth premises had 41 calls, but I wasn't able to um, remove ones that weren't directly re related to the premises for that one uh, because of the way that our, uh, our calls are recorded. Um, <clears throat> even more significantly, um, bearing in mind the area experiences, unfortunately, a high level of crime uh, and a high level of disorder. And we've discussed already a high level of deprivation, which I don't think anybody disputes. Um, gambling establishments for Hare Hills Lane, which is a large, long um, street, 7% of calls were to gambling establishments uh, over, the, over the year leading up to August. Hare Hills Road, again, an extremely long street. Uh, which is busy with pedestrians, has a lot of um, retail premises. That was 8% related to gambling establishments. Uh, and on Compton Road, uh, which is a much smaller street, 39% uh, of the total calls for Compton Road in the year leading up to August uh, were to gambling establishments. So I don't doubt um, that the... Um, the applicants, uh, professional uh, individuals who have a clear plan on how to address the various different concerns that have been raised. Um, and I've visited their premises elsewhere. And my opinion is that they are well-managed gambling establishments, but because of the nature of the area um, and the evidence that I've looked through, I don't think that their measures will be sufficient to control crime and disorder relating to the uh, proposed site if a license is granted. Um, they have uh, raised a comparison uh, within there with ASDA, uh, which they've mentioned, um, which also experiences a high level of demand. Um, but I, I would point out that the different premises, um, ASDA is an extremely large uh, supermarket, has thousands of people come in every day, sells thousands if not tens of thousands of pounds worth of products every day and um, all supermarkets in the Leeds area experience high levels of demand um, and, and police have to attend them regularly and um, they're just just a different type of premises um, yeah the only other point I would raise is I, I don't think the license should be granted that's that's my opinion that's why I've object, objected to it um, I'm particularly concerned about the late or relatively late opening hours um, where <clears throat> the other gambling establishments close at 10pm uh, um, and this site will remain open after that time. Um, so I, I suspect, so I don't know because it's not open yet, 
I suspect it will then attract problematic individuals uh, who have been thrown out, or not thrown out, but the, the other gambling establishments have closed and then it will be the only one that is open in the area. Um, and so then there's a higher likelihood of it attracting um, problems. Um, yeah, and that's my, uh, that's my objection. Okay, thank you. Um, do I have any questions from other members of the subcommittee? <clears throat> In which case, I'll, I'll ask one. You, you say that um, you've been through um, the details of the application and that uh, measures taken by the applicant are not sufficient uh, to address crime and disorder. Um, could you say specifically why you feel that there is a failing there and if there is anything that they could do that would um, persuade you otherwise? Or is it simply that there's nothing that can be done in your opinion? I, I do think that... The, I, I, I understand what they're saying. There will be a different type of establishment to a, to a betting office, which already exists, it is still ultimately a business which has gaming machines in it, which people attend to to play on the gaming machines. Um, unfortunately, no, I'm not sure that there are measures you could put in place other than fundamentally changing the nature of the business model. Um, as I say, I, I am particularly concerned about the late opening. Um, hours. Okay. Right. Thank you. Um, if no more questions from my colleagues. Uh, sorry, um, Chair. Can I can I just yeah. check with with um, um, uh, Sergeant Winster? Uh, are, are you um, putting your your representation? Is it on behalf of West Yorkshire Police, or is it in your own capacity? Just... It's on behalf of West Yorkshire Police. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. 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 Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Um, actually, that's just reminded me. Um, in the documents that we've been supplied, um, and I, I will ask this back of the applicant um, in due course, but um, it said local police currently liaising with local police licensing team. Now, I appreciate you're not part of the licensing team. You're the um, ward, um, you, um, ward manager, not ward manager. Anyway, you are. Yeah, yeah, are yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So have you been consulted by the police's licensing team? Um, a team about this um or is it uh, that your your objections are based on your uh, position as a ward manager um yeah yeah the, yeah they're basically yes my my primary role is to address uh, crime and any social behavior in the area and that's the yep. basis of the okay thank you. thank you right uh anything else for this witness no, in which case I will now ask uh, the council's licensing department to present their case, please. Thank you, Chair. I'm aware that I'm amongst a number of objectors that wish to speak today. Uh, my representation is full of facts and figures which would be laborious to go through. And so I don't intend to rehearse those details as they're available for members to read during the deliberation. However, it's those facts and figures that lead the licensing authority in its role as a responsible authority to urge the committee to consider if granting this license would promote the licensing objective of the protection of children and vulnerable people. As detailed in my representation, this premises is located in a vulnerable area, in an area of deprivation, and it's highly ranked against other areas in need for problems related to children and vulnerable people. We submitted further evidence compiled by Financial Inclusion, which provides more detail about the area, the groups we consider to be vulnerable, and information on those groups in the neighbourhood where this premises is placed. The evidence refers to gamblers who are at risk and who are experiencing problems with gambling, and describes the research undertaken by Leeds Becky University on behalf of the authority in 2016, which identified 1.8% of the population in Leeds to be problem gamblers, and a further 5 to 6% of people in Leeds to be at risk. The ward members, residents and the police are present today, and I'll leave describing what it's like to live and work in this neighbourhood to them, as they're far more qualified to discuss that matter. The licensing authority is acutely aware that the committee must aim to permit this license, taking into consideration the requirements already placed on the operator by the Gambling Commission's license conditions and codes of practice, with the council's policy and the licensing objectives secondary to this. We're cognizant of the difficulty in refusing gambling licenses outright. Therefore, although we would prefer a refusal, 
if the committee is minded to grant the licence, we would request that they apply the conditions that have been offered by the applicants at pages 304 and 306 of your pack, and also the following six conditions under section 1631 and 1691A and B of the Gambling Act, which will amend the operator's conditions 1, 15, 16 and 28. The licensing authority believes these conditions to be necessary, reasonable and proportionate, and moreover in keeping with those conditions already offered by the applicant. So I'll just quickly go through them. Number one, the opening hours should be restricted to 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. seven days a week. This is a dense residential area populated with vulnerable people and children. Closing the premises at 10 p.m. will reduce the risk of harm to vulnerable people who may attempt to play on the gaming machines having consumed alcohol or taken drugs. This consumption may not be enough to make them visibly affected and so be refused entry, but may affect their cognitive abilities. Closing the premises at 10 p.m. will minimise this risk. Number two, no single manning at any time. Two members of staff to be present during opening hours. It's difficult to understand how a single member of staff working on the premises is going to be able to perform their duties, inform the company policies, provide assistance to customers as well as control who, gets, who seeks to gain entry on the premises and identify customers who may be playing in a harmful way. Members should consider that the indicative plan show around 30 seats. As such, it's the opinion of the licensing authority that a premises with even half this number of potential customers would require at least two members of staff to be able to supervise the customers, identify those that may be gaming in a problematic way, and be able to provide brief intervention. Please bear in mind that providing a brief intervention may remove a single member of staff from their normal duties for some time. Number three, in addition to two members of staff inside the premises, SAA door staff to be provided at all times the premises is open. This is specific for this shop in this area. This specific area is deprived and already suffers from the antisocial behaviour of large groups of people gathering in the street to drink and socialise. My uh, colleagues, my more, the more members will describe that further. Specifically, there is an off licence in the same parade of shops which attracts such groups. The presence of a member of an SIA door staff to stop entry by vulnerable people under the influence of alcohol or drugs would reduce the detrimental effect on neighbouring businesses and residents. In addition, the presence of door staff on this parade of shops, albeit specifically attached to this premises, may help to improve behaviour in the area, but more importantly, will be able to support staff in controlling who enters the premises. We then have two conditions which relate to working with existing organisations who connect with people with gambling addiction and money concerns. Number four, the premises licence holder and staff will work with the NHS and GAMCARE gambling clinics and debt advice agencies in Leeds to receive specific training on problem gambling and the identification of vulnerable people. And five, the premises licence holder and staff will maintain links with the NHS and GAMCARE gambling clinics and debt advice agencies and provide information to customers and referrals where appropriate. We believe that linking in with the NHS and GAMCARE gambling clinics and debt advice services will provide the licence holder with local information on vulnerable people that will enable them to risk assess the locality. This is a requirement under the licence conditions and codes of practice and the current risk assessment is included in your pack. However, keeping this up to date is important and will be much aided by regular contacts and links with the gambling clinics and debt, debt advice agencies. And finally, the premises licence holder and staff will support local schemes and initiatives by working and taking an active role on the Hare Hills town team. The locals community team, war councillors and residents are working really hard to resolve issues and improve this area of Leeds, which has been an area of concern for a number of years. By linking into this work, the licence holder can gain valuable knowledge on the locality for the required risk assessment, but also help the community's team uh, to, to improve this area, to, to make it better. I'd very much appreciate it if members could take the information provided by the licensing authority and financial inclusion into account when making their determination. 
and to consider applying the six conditions if they're minded to grant the license. Obviously, we prefer it if the license was refused. Well, we're realistic and we're aware that this may be difficult. Uh, my colleague Sophia Ditter from Financial Inclusion is available to answer any questions on the data and research SMI. So thank you, Chair. Uh, I don't know if Sophia wanted to add anything. Thanks, Sue. So, yeah, I just wanted to add um, that although the applicant has stated that children won't be attracted uh, to the bingo premises, um, I would uh, also echo the councillors' uh, concerns that they raised earlier, uh, because in, in the additional report that we submitted, we've provided some information on from the lead school survey, uh, where bingo was found to be the second most popular form of gambling uh, among secondary age pupils, and 20% of the children that had gambled um, had taken part in bingo. So it, it is quite a popular form of gambling within for children within Leeds. So I just wanted to highlight that and that information and data is in the additional report that we've put together. Thank you. Okay, um, Susan, do either of your other witnesses wish to put any comments forward? Uh, no, Joe and Myrtle aren't present today. Right, okay, that's fine. Um, as I said earlier, I'm working from an iPad, so I have limited uh, the view of who's online at any one time. Okay. Um, to my colleagues um, on the subcommittee panel, um, do you have any questions for either Susan or Sophia? Right, I've got one for um, Sophia. You've identified the fact that um, bingo is popular um, mm -hmm. with, ch with children, with young people. Yeah. Um, how are they accessing it within Leeds? Um, um, yeah, obviously, we're looking at the potential for a, a bingo venue, which are saying yes. we're not getting children in. Um, there's going to be a desire, perhaps, from some to come in. How are they accessing it at the moment? From the school survey, um, we've, we've asked the question on whether they play online or uh, on premises or with their families. So it's uh, we think primarily it's online, but the fact that it's still popular within their um, it's on their agenda, so if they're able to access the venue, the uh, issue raised earlier where they, they would need to just be at the venue uh, to check the age, uh, that's, that's the reason I brought that point into okay. consideration, yeah. So although uh, in the school survey that we asked the question, um, they are primarily accessing it online, but with their parents or with their parents' permission, so it may be in some venues like the arcades as well. Yeah. OK, thank you. And a question to you, Susan. You've given six potential um, additional measures that you'd like us to consider um, if we're minded to grant. And um, obviously, I'll be asking the applicant their views on them. However, one, um, I'd just like to clarify, you've said um, condition two, no single manning, and then condition three um, to have an SA door staff. Um, would if we were minded and we were wanted to apply these, could that door staff member be the second member of staff, as it were? Because you were saying that it would be difficult to manage the property with one member of staff for up to 30 people. But if you've got somebody on the door who is then vetting people coming in, you do have a second person within, the, within or on the premise that can help should that be um, necessary? Or are you saying that there must be a minimum of two staff and a door staff? Obviously we would prefer two members of staff helping uh, customers and then a, a specific person minding the door to, to control entry, but also to control what's going on directly outside the premises as well. Um, however, it needs for members to decide if, if that's viable or reasonable. Yeah. OK, I was just uh, clarifying uh, your your um, your desire, as it were. Um, that's fine. OK, uh, if there are any no other questions from my colleagues, um, we will then move on to um, Councillor Reagan um, and your submission. Thank you. Uh, as I've already said, my name is Councillor Denise Reagan. I'm the uh, Ward member for Birmingham South Richmond Hill, of which this establishment is proposing to be based. And I'm also the, uh, the chair of the Inner East uh, Committee. And 
I have also lived in the area for up to 35 years. So I'm, I'm pretty uh, well uh, equipped to have knowledge of the, of the total area. Um, I've heard from so many local residents during this time uh, opposing this because it's, as we've already said, it's an area of, of, of high deprivation. It's got a lot of um, new uh, migration uh, communities coming into it. It's got a high proportion of young people and it's got a lot of vulnerability associated to it. On first glance of the application for a bingo licence, this looked not positive in the sense that it was a bingo lab, but it, it was a, a, indeed maybe a, a place where people could socialise and, uh, and, and look at that. But from further reading the application in more detail, I've discovered that this is not the case. And I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an application that um, for licensing to get a bingo license is a lot, is a, is a lot less stringent than getting a, a more detailed uh, uh, license for, uh, for, for gaming. As officers have shared, this area is one of the most deprived areas in Leeds, which I've clearly said, with several streets nearby the premises coming in as the uh, 1% deprived areas in the, in, in the country uh, regarding to the multiple uh, indices of deprivation. So that, and this includes the Comptons, which are directly opposite there. And it's also got the uh, Cliftons and Knowles, which is a priority area for the council at the moment, where, where we're dealing with six local areas of deprivation and unemployment and all the rest of it. And it's also got the Cowpers, which fall into my colleague's ward, and she will uh, she'll uh, go into detail of that uh, later on. Residents on this on these streets that I've mentioned already face huge problems and challenges because they've got. Uh, unemployment, they've got poverty, they've got education and health issues where the, the kids are not uh, attaining uh, educational uh, attainment, you know, uh, and, and they're not actually going to school because they're provided and distracted by other issues. And I feel that this particular gaming establishment will, will, will contribute to that because it'll in, in, it entice children away from their, uh, their schooling. Um, I think it, it also is, uh, a way, I see no way in which this proposed premises would do anything but exacerbate these issues for vulnerable people and it'll include more vulnerable people when they've got into the, the habit of gambling because at, at the minute, yeah, we've got people in that particular area that are struggling to feed themselves and feed their families and heat their premises and if they're on, on, on a limited budget, and if they're going to be established into this particular uh, gaming uh, area, the money's going to be going on gambling rather than going on to supporting the family and the housing. One such example of these individuals who congregate, yeah, we've got lots of people that are congregating in and around that particular area of uh, Herald's Lane, um, involved in, in street drinking and we're, we, we, we've, we've just set up a multi-agency approach to try and tackle that to support vulnerable residents. So I think that would, that would really uh, engage in that and it would, it would make it even worse. I think the proposed site on the parade of shops enjoyed by local families, it's got a fish shop, it's got a sandwich shop, it's got charity shops, it's got second-hand furniture shops as well as a bank. The proposed site was formerly occupied by a baker's. So that's, you know, why would we get rid of a baker's and, and, and uh, put a, uh, a gambling establishment in there? So make, make Merker slots would not be in keeping with the local area and the local businesses, which I know, yeah, that, that it would have a knock on effect to them. And it's, a, it's of real concern to us. The Meeting Point Cafe is a particular business which I would like to highlight. And this is a charitable organisation run by the Methodist Church and Circuit to provide for vulnerable people who are struggling, as I've said before, to provide uh, for themselves a good, hot, healthy meal and a place, safe place to socialise. And I think that this would, the, the Merkel slots would really have an effect on that. 
Yeah. And I think also we as ward councillors are very, very worried that this is a vital lifeline that would, would be put at risk with, with, with uh, associated antisocial behaviour, which the Mercus lots may bring with it. The Compton Centre is just directly over the road from the proposed site, metres away, and this provides many residents from both of the wards with support with their housing, employment and benefits and so much more. And I do, want, do not want to put this particular organisation and establishment at risk. And again, this gambling premises could have serious knocking effects to that. Um, I'd just like to finish with some quotes from local residents which have approached me. One of them have said, another betting shop is not what the area needs. It will attract gatherings of drinkers to that corner with all the ensuing antisocial behaviours. Not good for local people and children who will have to navigate through when going to the library, nursery, park or doctors. Another one have said, no, no, no to this planning application. There are already two betting shops in Herald's and they cause enough problems. And finally, exactly not what this area is needed. And I think, you know, to finish, we, we stand firmly with our local residents and businesses and partners against this application. And I'd now like to call on my two witnesses, um, Christina and uh, Donna to, uh, to add to that. So thank you. Good morning, I'm Christina Giorgio. We have an established business on Hales Lane. We've been there since 1984, so we know the area pretty well and the locals and other business users. We say a new arcade would encourage crime and feed addiction and could put young and vulnerable people already in a struggling deprived area at more risk and it would offer no benefit whatsoever. Similar venues often become a hive for crime and drug dealing often attracting unruly teenagers, drinkers and homeless to gather outside, which would in turn put people off. We already have plenty of gambling outlets in areas. We don't need any more, and they already attract a lot of trouble. People of all ages should remain alert to the fact that gambling can be highly addictive and extremely damaging, not only to individuals, but also to their families and entire communities. I am really against this as a business owner. I urge you all to think with caution. Does Hairbles and its people really deserve this? Thank you for listening. Thank you. Do we have the other uh, um, witness? Can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry, it's uh, first time zooming on a laptop. I don't have one mute. Um, hi, good morning. My name's Donna. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the residents of Bermondsoft and Richmond Hill. I'm a resident of the Knowles. Um, I'm part of a residence group and we volunteer our time to help the youth of the area and um, possibly access opportunities that they're possibly not aware of and um, when we're able we use the community and we open that to the youth. Um, I'm not going to waste any time trying to pick holes in the bid. Um, it's been thousands and thousands of pounds of billable hours to make sure that all the boxes are ticked, you know, crossing the T's, dotting the I's. But I am speaking as a resident and a parent and a parent with a desire that our voice heard Herald's is a very transient community. As such problems arise, the people involved move on and the issues swept under the carpet. But what about us, the long-term residents, the ones who love the area? We love our amazing homes. We love the heritage, the stories, and we're doing everything possible to have the positives recognised. I mean, our location centre, we should be way up there, you know, the most desirable area in the world. Why would another gambling hinder us? One of my colleagues, friends, um, said, we have a problem with boredom in the area, from children all the way up to adults, and you can add in frustration as well. 
a slot machine hall, stroke bingo hall seems like a really innocent way to spend a few hours to entertain yourself or to switch from life for a little bit. But they have been shown to be addictive. And soon those innocent couple of hours becomes a need and more than a couple of hours. So while it may solve the issue of boredom, it is compounding the financial problems that a lot in the area face, which can be part of the source of the frustration felt in the area. Boredom in the life frustration often comes alcohol and drugs, which in turn leads to the antisocial behaviour within the property in the area around it, and then follows people home to become domestic abuse. The area doesn't need extra vices added, but it absolutely does need more investment into social areas and programmes, self-confidence and self-worth of the people living here so they can change the situation and improve the lot should they wish to, not just carry on the cycle of where they are. It's not going to promote hair rolls, it's going to encourage groups of drinkers, just like our coral, it's going to increase violence, gambling problems and theft. <coughs> People already feel afraid to walk on the lane in Compton Road. They're sick of navigating the groups gathered and the fear of being mugged, robbed or assaulted. The aesthetics, the children walk this way to school. It's a baker's window to cut at the moment, but soon the main crossroads between Herald's and Berman's house will be a row of blacked out windows. There are plenty of websites for this kind of gambling. Um, it doesn't need to be placed in the heart of the community where gambling is an issue. It would encourage possibly groups, dealers to use the premises as a base for other activities. Um, we can't watch everything every two minutes. Um, it can also be a way of money laundering, passing on possible illegal earnings um, as a way of winnings. Um, it will, to quote another person, promote misery and create further poverty in the area. People will spend what money they have and then the rates of theft and antisocial behaviour will increase. It's encouraging misery in Herald, not positivity. I'd just like to reiterate what Denise, sorry, Councillor Reagan was saying. At the top of this particular road, we have a 24 hour licensed or off license which is constantly having issues i mean the cell booze through the hatch at three o'clock in the morning what does that say to you about the area that it's in then the meeting point cafe you know the church recognizes an issue we as a housing advisory panel are funding outreach workers um to actually engage with the addicts be it gambling drugs um or alcohol we're encouraging them to use the Meeting Point Cafe. We're encouraging them to look at other options that they have in life. And then two doors down, we say, oh, look, here's a new shiny little bauble. This is gambling. Look what it could do for you. It's a complete slap in the face. We're, we're going one step forward. We're taking five steps back. You're always going to have your hardcore gamblers chasing the next big fix, chasing the one that's going to pay the rent, that's going to do this, that or the other. But at the end of the day, our gambling boils down to the fact that they're going to have the money to pay the kids, you know, to pay food, to put food on the table, to pay the rent, to keep a roof over the head. We are talking people that gamble their last pound because this would be the one. This is the one where it drops. We're not talking about a bingo hall where it's your little blue rinse brigade that stand outside the Mecca having a sick break. We're talking, you know, I mean, those people wouldn't dare stand out on the lane. There are too many groups, they'd be too intimidated. It's straightforward slot machine gambling. It's not encouraging communication, interpersonal skills or any sense of community. And my next main concern is the children. They are primed. They're playing the Xboxes, they're playing the PlayStation. It's another click. It's another 99p for these Roblox, whatever. This is the next generation of addicts. They, this is the future. We're just dangling the carrot in front of them as the next quick fix. We need an increase in life skills. We need interaction. We need interpersonal skills. So please, councillors, when you're considering this application, please think about the people that live here. Please think about the children growing up here and the future generations. Someone somewhere has to take ownership. Say enough is enough. Encourage people to dream, not to just think, how do I get past this next day? to aspire, to love where they live. We've got the amazing architecture, we've got the facilities, we've got the location. We want them to take pride, not just exist. Please help us to do this. Please say no to our misery for the residents of Herald's. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. Do we have any questions for Councillor Reagan or Christina? Um, or no, or Donna from uh, the uh, panel? No. Could I, could I ask a question to yes, um, Councillor yeah. Reagan, please? Thank yes. you. Um, in, in, uh, are you aware, Councillor Reagan, of any residents who are supportive of uh, the uh, proposal? None. Thank you. Any further questions? Not from no. me. In that case, I now ask, ask Councillor Arif to um, put, give us her submission, her objections, please. Thank you, Councillor Downs. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you to um, Donna um, for, that, um, for that representation. Thank you very much. I know Donna, Karen, Christina, you've taken time off work to be here today um, and that matters. Um, so I'm Councillor Salma Arif. Now, just for context, um, I was actually born in the Knowles. I lived on Hare Hills Lane for 30 years of my life. So I, I know the area and it's a, a, an honour and a privilege to now represent the people of Hare Hills. So I, I represent Gipton and Hare Hills and I'm also the lead member for Child Friendly Leeds. Now, what does Child Friendly Leeds mean? Well, as a council, we want to ensure that everyone helps children and young people thrive in our city. As a ward councillor representing Hare Hills, it is vital that I articulate the scale of the opposition there is to this bingo licence application. I'm speaking on behalf of my ward colleagues and we stand in unison with our colleagues representing Bermontoffs and Richmond Hill. As officers, of, officers have already shared, there are a number of reasons why this proposed site is both unnecessary and would put vulnerable individuals at risk in both of our wards. Um, so this application has come from the Geiselman Group. The Geiselman Group is a German gaming and gambling company uh, with a revenue of around 3 billion euros. Now that's just, just for context. Um, the applicant already has five premises in Leeds. Uh, there's Merca Casino in Armley on Town Street. There's Merca Casino in Bramley Centre. Uh, there's Merca Casino in Morley Milton House. Uh, there's Merca Casino in City Centre as well. And finally, just up the road, there's Merca Casino in Crossgates on Osthorpe Road. Now, for anybody who knows Leeds, they'll know what do these um, five locations have in, have in common? Well, they're in parts of the more deprived areas in Leeds. This begs the question, is the business model to open Merca slots in deprived areas, a demographic that has perhaps targets the most vulnerable in our society? OK, let's start with the location of the proposed premise. Although the location is technically located in my colleague's ward of Bermatoffs and Richmond Hill, it, is also, it also borders the ward I represent as a local councillor. I have deep concerns about the knock-on effect the prem this premise would have have. This is in a neighbourhood that has residents facing some of the most severe social and economic challenges in the UK, complex challenges that have been exasperated by the COVID-19 pandemic members. Members, there is a reason why this area has a, in place a public space protection order, PSPO and a cumulative impact policy, both of which have come into place after lengthy lobbying and legal processes, but very much needed to tackle the existing problems in this area. The area covered by this application is one that has seen many residents, particularly children and young people, in challenging circumstances. And this has been outlined by Sue earlier. So I won't repeat the statistics, but as lead member for Child Friendly Leeds, the risk to children, which I will touch on later, is a particular concern for me. It's also worth pointing out there are two primary schools located within just 550 metres of the proposed site, as well as several other schools located within a kilometre of the proposed location. There is a school uniform shop, Joe Brand, um, just literally a few shops away. Further exposing young kids, these sorts of environments surrounding them from all sides. I'm not sure placing a betting, uh, betting premises in the heart of a heavily populated residential area is being respectful of the community. Within half a mile radius, you have a number of gambling premises, including two Betfreds, four William Hills, a Paddy Power, a Ladbrokes, and a Coral Bookies, of which many have faced issues related to antisocial behaviour, drug use, street drinking, making life difficult for residents in an already hard to live area and put further strain on the police force for which residents are already aware of and find it difficult to deal with, um, with the existing level of issues, which is why a lot of this crime does actually go unreported. 
granting of this application would exasperate existing issues by supplying an, an opportunity for problem gambling or gambling addiction to take hold in the area already saturated with betting shops. I also believe that a gambling operation would pose a very real threat to the health and well-being of local children and well-being. Only last week, the Gambling Commission released figures that showed a shocking increase in the number of 11 to 16 year olds classified as problem gamblers. I was also distressed to be made aware of a several recent examples of young people with gambling addiction, addiction issues that are currently going through the Youth Justice Service. A number of young, young people, 15 to 17 year olds, have reported that they have they had been able to access the shops to either bet or use gambling gaming machines, both on Hare Hills Lane and other nearby shops. They were borrowing finance. Uh, they were borrowing to finance this and then committing offences to service this debt. These offences tend to be robbery in nature and often involve some degree of violence and weapons. Now, members, the applicants' representative has pointed a peaceful picture of a very low footfall and handful of people or ladies sipping teas. Now, respectfully, if that was the intention, then the applicant ought to open a tea shop, not a betting shop in a deprived area that has a high ratio of vulnerable people, has crime and disorder, that is, in a, that is on a well-trodden school route, that there is a high prevalence of teenage gambling and that this is particularly an improvised area. Despite what the applicant wants you to believe, sadly, this shot will not only be a leisurely activity, it really seldom is. Members, um, I'll finish on this and I'll, uh, with one question, really. Can we afford to gamble with the future of our children? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Arif. Um, do either of my colleagues on the uh, panel um, have any questions they'd like to um, ask Councillor Arif? I do actually, Chair, if that's yes. okay. okay. So, uh, so Councillor Arif, um, with your knowledge and experience of, of the area, of the demographics of the area, with, with the, you know, the, the um, deprivation, et cetera, et cetera, within, within that area, what, in your opinion, could Mercus Slots, the applicant, do to protect not just children, but vulnerable persons from being harmed or exploited by gambling? Honestly, Is there anything um, that they could do. Yeah, if I'm really, really honest, you know, respectfully, um, I, I do think you know there are, you know, brilliant things that the applicant wants to put in place. It just will not work in Hare Hills. We are oversubscribed with the issues that we've got, despite their best efforts, which I, you know, I'm sure you know that they will put efforts in and will train their staff and. It just simply, in my opinion, knowing the area the way I know it, it will exasperate the problem we've got despite the best efforts. So I do not think there is anything the applicant do other than effectively not have a shop there. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Right. Thank you, Councillor Arif. We now move on to Karen Harris. Um, if you'd like to uh, list your objections for us, please. Thank you. Thank you. And again, uh, I, I completely concur with the uh, what's been said by Donna and Salma. Um, I've lived in Hare Hills for 30 years now. I came here when I was 23 years old. Um, I've also worked in the area for quite some of that time. Um, and I've also worked for neighbourhood network schemes with, which uh, support older people um, in, in and around Leeds. Um, I've got numbers. I base the, the numbering is based on the um, additional information document that was sent. So first, I'd like to just make it really clear that I view young people as two distinct groups. There are children under 16 who obviously shouldn't be allowed within any premises, but they will be affected by the ripples outside of a premises. And there are young people who will be old enough to have legal access to the premises, but are highly vulnerable and will be very much attracted by the activities that are off offered on that premises. Page 43 talks about being within easy reach as if it's a good thing. Proximity to vulnerable people is not a good thing in Hare Hills. Uh, it's not an affluent area and it is densely populated. Constant bingo from nine till midnight can only be seen to have an adverse impact on the many people who live in close proximity to that area. We have to remember that it's 
highly residential yes there are high streets but unusually they are surrounded by people living above and around and behind despite most existing facilities closing at 10 resultant noise still has an adverse effect on young children who need to be able to get a good night's sleep before school it states that an average stake is between 30 to 40 uh, pence. This encourages folk with even very little money to gamble away what they can ill afford to lose. Whilst it may not seem like a lot to lose for people here, uh, may I point out that many folk in this area are living in poverty. They rely on meters for their electricity. 30 pence will keep your cooker going for an hour, just enough time to prepare your children at least one hot meal a day, or maybe two if you're just heating up beans and boiling an egg. One pound runs a shower for an hour, just enough to allow a family of six to have a 10 minute shower each. We have neighbors who sit in the dark so that they can watch TV. Our local food banks are currently overwhelmed by families, many of whom actually do work, but who can no longer afford to feed themselves adequately. There are many unregistered lets in the area with cash in hand deals being made with less scrupulous landlords. Therefore, it is not unusual for entire families to get around not having the rent uh, by flitting from one rental house to another, rather than curbing any habit of gambling their rent money away. This means that children are subjected to unstable and stressful lives with all the attendant issues that that then brings. You say that venues appeal to, uh, to all ages, but uh, we'll ask if anyone looks under uh, 25 to show ID. Hare Hills has a population of 33,000 in a two square miles with one of the highest percentages of under 25s. Um, and uh, these stakes allow young people to spend pocket money and lunch money. We have high rates of NEETs, which are uh, youth uh, and youth services and even the police struggle to supervise groups of teenagers who have very little else to do and nowhere really to go. And I wonder how staff will be able to be any better equipped than the police to deal with this. Uh, it says that you provide compli complimentary refreshments, teas and coffees to customers um, and staff will not allow people on who appear to be intoxicated and that's the thing often people can be intoxicated but not appear to be that's a very difficult call to make we know from existing gambling outlets that people will drink outside and it is a big worry that there are relatively large open spaces at the corner where there are two crossings that passerbys need to use so it's that compton road and um uh Hare hills lane corner um, and that they would have to negotiate through any congregations of people there. There's also a cut through between where the Joe Bland, Brand shop is and the parade that the gambling and Gilchrist is, and it cuts through. And that's already had lots of attendant antisocial behaviours. And it's a real worry that that will just become like an open latrine. And then also there's the car park at the back. So whilst the shop might, whilst the bingo place might be able to say it hasn't got people hanging around outside the front, how are they going to guarantee that there aren't going to be these congregations going on to the side and behind? Um, you say that your appeal is 52% male to 48% women uh, and that there'll be self-help tools you say that you increase um the the increased footfall will be beneficial to the high uh, high street this is not an issue hare hills has a thriving high street to which uh, the major inhibitor is already the congregation of con customers outside existing gambling shops and parking is already a problem you say that you will create local jobs about six to twelve people depending on the hours of operation presumably some of these will be managers are you saying that at least some of these jobs will offer managerial opportunities for local people what actual post do you envisage local people getting? Hare Hills has 36.4% economically inactive population. We do not feel that six jobs will offset the negative effects that this enterprise would bring to the area. On page 56, you say that 61% of the staff are female. Many women in Hare Hills report total lack of confidence in walking around the area, especially at night. How would any female staff be kept safe? You say you will provide important natural surveillance. We already have surveillance. Local people are sadly very well aware of where the antisocial behaviour occurs. 
but sadly surveillance does not necessarily guarantee that the issues are satisfactorily dealt with. On your plan you have one unisex toilet and 26 possible gambling stations. If you also have tablets and other handheld devices to use or Wi-Fi to link from your own devices, how many customers do you anticipate frequenting the space at any one time? Would the Wi-Fi access mean that people could potentially play from outside the premises? You say you only expect uh, to get 12 people at any one time on your premises. However, this area has large groups of young people who would be old enough to enter, who are at a loss as to what to do with themselves. And on wet days with free drinks and on offer, you could potentially have large groups frequenting your premises. You make repeated reference to having prominent information on age restrictions, be gamble aware and uh, complaints procedures. How many languages will this cover? Also, how will folk who struggle to pay for connectivity access a Playwright app to enable them to manage their gambling and spending? And would your staff be equipped to handle this? Uh, you refer to Beacon Bingo Cricklewood uh, in Europe, which is a 24 hours, 2,700 capacity, three bars, two restaurants and a large smoking area. Uh, the site has been um, a family baker's small cafe based it, um, and it equates to two high street terrace shops. What are your future plans? Hare is, Hare Hills is already struggling as a destination for people seeking cheap alcohol and drugs, as testified by the police. We already have issues with parking congestion due to access to St James's Hospital through traffic to the city centre. Any larger outlet would be deeply inappropriate and this application must not be seen as a foothold for greater development. Page 60, we talk about Gambling Commission's statement, regulatory risk management, gambling compliance, charitable, charitable donations and a few self-fair used apps will not negate the damage done to young folk drawn into gambling. You claim that there will be uh, uh, linked uh, trips helping support other businesses. In other, you're saying that people are going to come in to gamble and then go and do a bit of shopping. We believe that the only businesses this will further support are the nearby off licenses. We have precedent for this as it's exactly what happens outside Betfred on Hare Hills Road and Betfred and Paddy Power on Hare Hills Lane. In fact, given that there is a high likelihood of people starting to gather outside the cut through that leads uh, from Hare Hills Lane to the Bell Brook car parking facility, it is likely that actual shoppers heading to the lane will be put off or fearful of leaving their cars if they start passing through groups of standing people. You highlight uh, GTAB Bingo and other electronic multimedia ways to access Bingo. It points to the main target being younger people. There aren't many of the older people that I've worked with in the last 10 years who are that or fear with that kind of equipment. Uh, it's very high tech. Low stakes also encourage young people to spend pocket money. You highlight Lucky Charm with 20p, 50p, one pound stakes to a maximum of four pound per game but there's nothing about the restriction on the number of games uh, i see this as doubly negative as it will either allow people with very little money to play with what little they have or for those who have a bit more money to play on until they are totally spent up either way this is encouraging those who can least afford it to fritter away their money you even have low state games from 5p to a maximum of a pound per game, but again, no limit on the number of games. Many of these games interfaces are clearly aimed at young people and what may be presented as an innocuous game of bingo or computer game can effectively draw people into bigger stakes gambling and into desperate gambling addictions. Then there follows the section with all the principles applied licensing authorities authorities licensing should take account protecting children absolutely and as i pointed out this site is uh, this site is right at the heart of a civic area with libraries nurseries health clinics and routes to several schools and a park preventing gambling being a source of crime. The area already is already noted for particular problems with disorder, organized criminal activity is rife and the police already struggle to address this. There is a likelihood of serious disruptive antisocial behavior that will impact local residents. It will be more than a mere nuisance. There have been stabbings, attacks, assaults and numerous police call outs. There is issues with young people, 15 to 25 year olds congregating and causing issues. And sadly, there have been several stabbings amongst these age groups. 
The issues in Hare Hills are around congregation of drinkers, etc., who take over areas outside focus points like gambling premises uh, and, and empty spaces. Communities and police have been liaising for decades through various means, including the PAC meetings, but this has never managed to free the area of its ongoing issues. Protecting children and other vulnerable persons. Could staff adequately supervise? the gambling presence. The police with their powers uh, have trouble keeping order. Hare Hills uh, had a banning order on fireworks this year but still in as in previous years young people were able to get hold of this stuff despite the age restrictions. Positioning is a disaster for any attempts to improve the street scene and existing antisocial issues. Hare Hills has more than the average number of vulnerable adults due to cheap available, not too many questions asked renting. We have higher levels of people who have drug, alcohol and gambling addictions, mental health issues and long-term chronic health conditions, all contrived to make people who often find themselves lonely being drawn into groups and situations that are not good for their safety, well-being or recovery. The area is also used to house many people who are under supervision or serving out probation terms. We also have significant rates of serious domestic violence and it is acknowledged that we're around finances is a major contributor. Good practice and regulation. It's irrelevant to residents how many regulations have been tick boxed. Resultant antisocial behaviour that has immediate negative impact on local residents can sometimes take years to address. Crime stats show that betting and gambling uh, premises are always either the greatest or amongst the greatest when it comes to gambling in the whole city. People in Hare Hills, first and foremost, just want a basic human right to live in a healthy, safe environment where their children are free from negative influence. Many families have fled countries where serious human rights abuses have been committed against them. It is often said with derision that anything goes in Hare Hills. There are many who seek to exploit and make money out of the area with little regard to the effect their activities have on people who actually live here. For various reasons, lack of knowledge or know-how or confidence to navigate a planning system that is difficult to negotiate, 272 page, pages, without experience, Hare Hills has struggled to prevent numerous planning and licensing decisions that have brought on only negative impact to local communities. We, are, as a long-suffering residents uh, who have watched being directly affected by the area decline combined activities of licensed premises and gambling outlets have no confidence that supposed conditions have any positive effect upon the antisocial behaviour that has dragged the area down and caused those who live here such ongoing misery. The objections are not moral or ethical or based on general notion that gambling is undesirable. They are based on the sorrowful experience of the associated antisocial behaviours that are fuelled by existing license and gambling outlets. They are in the testimony of the women who, do, who dare not walk through crowds of drunk and lascivious men who spend their days and nights gathered outside existing outlets. They are etched on the pavements of the local high streets in vomit, urine and faeces. They are written on the faces of small children who witness things that no children should see on their way to school or nursery or the tired faces of older children kept awake by noise outside their homes. They are in the police crime statistics that show many incidents related either to hanging around premises or muggings as desperate, desperate people seek to get the money to feed their addictions. Gilchrist's was a much loved family bakery and cafe. It served the area for decades. It's located in a significant gateway, one of Hare Hill's main high streets, adjacent to the local library, the nursery, as I've said, Bellbrook Surgery. It's also a route to Nightingale Primary School, Shakespeare High School, and a local park. There is also a school uniform shop less than a few units away. We would, uh, we would have hoped for much more positive development of this newly vacant premises that would help to lift the area rather than compound already negative issues and perceptions. And final bit, 
Uh, there are 340,000 problem gamblers in the UK, 10,000 are in Leeds. There is real poverty in Hare Hills, not just in financial terms, but in terms of mental health, well-being, education and aspiration. This is exactly the area that is seen as a soft target where people who are prone to advertising and less able to read the small print. Many people are paid cash in hand um, uh, less able to um, and, and do not, despite myths, have um, access to benefits. Betting shops and online gambling are seen as a quick fix. And so the temptation is to place hope in easy, in, in easy gambling opportunities. And this causes massive issues within already struggling com, uh, communities. And we don't think Hair Hills will benefit at all from this. Thank you, Karen. Do we have any questions for Karen from the other panel members? I think that was a very comprehensive um, submission. Thank you, Karen. OK, um, we now move back to um, the applicant to respond to the issues that have been raised by the objectors. Could I just check with um, officers how much time is left on the uh, um, 20 minutes from before. Just to jump in there, Councillor Downs, it's Natasha yeah. Governance. Um, the applicant had nine minutes left. Okay, so um, just to hand back over to you, Mr. Colvin, you have nine minutes left uh, to do your best to address the um, concerns raised, um, but that doesn't mean that uh, the panel won't be asking you further questions after that. Okay, so I'm going to try my very best to deal with this in nine minutes, but I've been scrawling away for an hour and a half, and uh, I'm, I'm afraid I may stray over, but uh, I'm certainly not going to stray over by much. Um, can I just say, I mean, listening to all these local people, it's, it's impossible not to admire hugely um, their voices and their, their local knowledge uh, and their local passion. So whatever I say here, I don't want it to sound sort of preachy or finger wagging or, or, or anything of that sort. Um, but it's right to say that this is not a, a referendum. Uh, this is a, a regulatory hearing which has to be considered on the evidence. And much of what we've heard is about fear of what might be if this license is granted. Um, and what we've provided to you is a huge amount of evidence as uh, about what is, uh, not just nationally, but locally. And uh, one of the uh, witnesses, I think it was Councillor Arif, pointed to an allegation that all five of my clients' existing premises were in deprived areas of Leeds. Well, if so, then you have a proper empirical ability to test out whether any of the fears which have been expressed to you would materialize in practice, not in general or in the abstract, but in leads, in deprived areas. And not only do residents who might not be expected to go there, uh, not only do they not have any evidence, but you have heard from responsible authorities one of whom have actually visited my clients' other premises and who have access to all the data, all the records about whether any of these fears have been realised in practice. And the answer is they have not. And I say that very firmly on the evidence. There is no evidence that my client's premises will bring the kind of issues uh, which have been uh, suggested. My client's other premises have no conditions on them, but here my client is bringing 35 conditions in deference to the issues uh, which people fear. And it's, it's commonly happens that these fears are expressed. And when my client opens its premises, those fears disappear. It has never suffered a review. The licensed betting officers are said to be a source of crime. Well, they also trade without conditions. But what seems remarkable to me as a licensing regulatory lawyer is that these problems are being expressed about local licensed premises and there hasn't been a review of any of them. And maybe there should be. I don't want to advocate that. But if none of these premises have even merited a review, why would you be closing your doors on a further licensed premises. And actually, what this act requires you to do is not to close your door, but as Patterson's puts it, aim to permit 
by taking an imaginative approach to frame conditions to, so as to reply to legitimate concerns which have been expressed. So that's what I want to say in general. Can I say some things in particular, then I'll come and deal with the legal test and then I will shut up. Um, we heard from uh, Sergeant Winster and he visited clients' premises elsewhere, found they were well managed and has reported to you precisely nothing about crime and disorder issues arising in those premises. And yet you're being asked to accept that these premises would be some hotbed of crime and disorder, when in fact, empirically, you know that my client's premises elsewhere or are not. He also refers, as did a number of witnesses, to the existence of 24-hour off licenses. A number of your witnesses referred to that. And I can see that Leeds has recently reinstituted his drink banning order, although uh, Mr. Butterworth didn't find that being enforced when he was there. And if you've got a problem with street drinking and 70% of your local shops selling cheap booze, as has been said by one person, and shops selling alcohol through a hatch at three o'clock in the morning, well, then you've got an issue there. And in accordance with your vision for Hare Hills, deal with that issue. But when it comes to the aim to permit, provided the regulatory tests are met, that is a side issue. Uh, and it's not a reason to stop a further gambling establishment, particularly when nothing has apparently been done about the gambling establishments which you have. I will come back and deal with the conditions which have been suggested uh, in just uh, a second. Um, Ms. Ditter uh, referred to uh, the proclivity to play bingo amongst children. Actually, if you look at the data on page 328, uh, the proclivity is in children under the age of 16. The data about children over the age of 16, bingo doesn't figure at all. I think what's happening, and you asked the question, sir, is that kids are getting hold of scratch cards which are being brought by their older siblings or their, even their parents. But this is nothing whatsoever to do with my client. There will not be underage people in my client's premises. And if there were, it's more than my client's license and reputation is worth. It would be leapt on with alacrity. It is certainly no reason to refuse this uh, application. Uh, Councillor Regan says it's easy to do bingo license and another sort of license that's just not right. Everyone has to go through exactly the same hoops and is subject to LCCP's mandatory default conditions, which are specific to them. And they are equally draconian for all sorts uh, of premises. Uh, she refers to street drinking. I've dealt with street drinking. If that's an issue in Hare Hills, it needs to be dealt with, but it's not going to be dealt with by refusing a bingo application when there is no evidence from 180 premises that they attract street drinkers, even in areas where there are street drinkers. Uh, various witnesses referred to planning matters, which are simply irrelevant. Whether Gilchrist was nice or not nice, whether this is in accordance with the vision and all of those sorts of questions, I pass over quickly. Your planners have looked at this and incidentally, they've granted planning permission, but it's not relevant to your consideration. Um, da -da -da, I'm just gonna pass over uh, quite a number of points so as not to duplicate. Oh, there was a point made by Donna, who did make a very, if I can just pay a tribute, made, made a very passionate and, and um, uh, heartfelt address as to why this should not be permitted. Um, but one of her problems uh, was that there would be um, drug dealing happening in the premises. It would be about the worst place in Hare Hills to deal drugs. Um, because it's under CCTV, you'd never be more than a few metres from a, um, a staff member and you can't hide in a crowd because there is no crowd. One of the witnesses suggested with 30 seats, there might be 15 people in the premises. If there's five in my client's premises, that would be a lot. There seems to have been a complete misunderstanding as to the number of people who would come in. And I'd invite any of your witnesses or you yourselves, members of the committee, to go and see how many people you get in these premises. You don't need staff crawling all over the place. Uh, you, you might in the morning get one or two, you might get in the evening get two or three. If you've got 10, that would be really, really exceptional. And this is explained uh, in the evidence. Uh, again, passing on very quickly, Qu 
quite a lot of points were made about the current betting officers, which I hope the point has been made. My client does not trade like a betting officer. It's a different product. It attracts a different crowd. And empirically and historically, while trading in many, many deprived areas, it just doesn't get problems. And I put this out there. If somebody wants to disprove that or gainsay it, let them. But there is no evidence. And if those problems did materialize, then any one of these good residents or local councillors or officers could bring a review and say that those lovely honeyed words spoken by that paid representative were not true. And these problems they promised did not arise have arisen. Now, please do something about it. And you'd find uh, your representative, if it happened to be me, rather contrite on a review hearing if problems did materialize contrary uh, to what I have said. Um, Karen Harris spoke and said that um, uh, underage people will be able to access the venue. I think she said over 16, so it just isn't right with respect. Under 18s uh, will uh, just not be allowed in these premises. Uh, it will not occur. So far as uh, her uh, concerns about nuisance are concerned, of course my client will be neighbourly, of course my client will have treat the neighbours kindly notices, of course it will monitor the exterior, but nuisance is not a licensing consideration for you as the Act and the guidance makes clear. She also spoke about the rear of the premises, there's no rear access to my client's premises, but my client would certainly be content to put CCTV around the premises to make sure that uh, nothing untoward was happening. Uh, on uh, any uh, on on any side, there was a concern from her that my client might use this as a foothold to expand operations. Uh, it won't be doing that. The model is a small high street bingo premises. Uh, Beacon Bingo in Cricklewood with its massive flat floor, etc., is a completely different sort of operation by a different company in the group. That is not what uh, this is. There's also a suggestion that games interfaces are aimed at young people. I know that she, she wouldn't have access to all the sort of technical rules on this, but they mustn't be, they can't be, and they aren't, because it would be uh, against the law. Uh, and, and so I come to what this test is actually about. The context of this is UK gambling regulation, which is an aim to permit. And some of the submissions you've heard almost supposes that gambling doesn't happen in Hare Hills. And my client would bring some great gambling leviathan to the to the midst of this community. No. Gambling does happen in Hare Hills. It happens in news agents through lottery terminals. It happens in betting offices. It happens in pubs. It happens online. That is not what this act is trying to do, is to say there must not be gambling. It's a horrible thing. What the Gambling Act is aiming to do is to ask you to aim to permit and imaginatively to frame conditions with the assistance of the applicant to meet concerns about negative impacts. It's not inviting you to say this is the wrong area for gambling, as the Gambling Act guidance makes absolutely clear and as I have taken you to. Can I penultimately just say a word about conditions? Um, some new conditions were suggested, which uh, we were scrawling down and been communicating uh, about them on, on, on WhatsApp. I, I'm a bit sad they weren't discussed beforehand, but I'm just going to do my best to deal with them. Um, conditions four, five and six are yes, emphatically yes. My client would be very pleased to do all of these things. Uh, condition one, uh, the planning hours incidentally are eight till 11. Uh, my client uh, has offered nine until 12. Uh, it's suggested, well, it should come back till 10 because people might leave the betting offices and stream into the bingo clubs. That is simply not my client's experience from elsewhere. And if you want evidence of that, look at Mr. Butterworth, his material, or take it from me that there isn't that kind of linkage with the nighttime economy that people tumble out of pubs, clubs, or betting offices and into bingo. It is a different demographic. It operates at a low level. And for my client to offer 12 is a condition which uh, is on a tiny handful of the 180 premises which it operates. It involves my client giving up 9.24 or 40% of its potential trade. It is a fair and reasonable offer. Can I reiterate, please, 
is that when you look at what the Gambling Commission has to say about uh, conditions, and you can find that, you don't need to turn it up now, on page 75 of the bundle, the test is necessity. And you do not have any evidence with respect that it's necessary to put a 10 o'clock condition on this license. So we, we wouldn't go with that. We do accept, however, that there's an 11 o'clock condition currently on planning. And my client obviously has to observe whichever the tighter condition is. Sorry, Mr. So Mr. far Mr. as Colby, single manning at any time is concerned. Sorry, sorry Chair. Um, uh, Mr. Colvin, you exceeded your 20 minutes, but I think, Chair, you might find it's important that Mr. Colvin does address these suggested conditions. Um, I'm going as quickly as well, I can, and I think I'll finish in about could, three could minutes. I, thank, thank you. So, so your time, whilst your time has expired, um, one of the questions that I had got down that I indeed wanted to ask you was, um, could I have your response to the licensing um, uh, department's uh, suggestion for these six so we will carry that on as a question of mine um Thanks. As a, i would i would like to hear what your thoughts are Thanks. and i'll also come back to you on what you've already said on them Thanks so much. And then I'm just going to wrap up the law very, very quickly. As you can see, I'm trying not to hang around. I'm trying to be as respectful as I can about the uh, the, the time limits. So far as single manning at any time is concerned, that isn't on any license in my client's estate. And I doubt you'll find it on many uh, gam high street gambling licenses anywhere in the country. Uh, it's just it, it would kill the operation and uh, it's not necessary in accordance with the licensing objectives. If you double manned, you might have two staff members on in the morning supervising nil people and it would just be uh, an impossible thing uh, to manage. And it, it'd be an extraordinary thing to do, given that you don't have double manning conditions on any of the licensed betting officers in the area, uh, even though it's being said to you that they are a problem. And so this would just be unfair, unnecessary and discriminatory. The way it will actually work is that my client, in accordance with its standard procedures, will analyse how many customers are in the premises at particular times, will consider whether there are local issues and the ability of the staff to manage those issues and will roster accordingly. It's really happy to have a condition that says it'll risk assess that and share the risk assessment with the licensing authority. And if it gets it wrong or there's a disagreement, then it would come back on a review, but that has never happened. And with respect, my client needs to be left to, left to be able to plan its operation so as to promote the licensing objective itself, so as to protect players and protect uh, its local staff. Uh, so that would not be an appropriate condition. Uh, there already is a suggested condition about double manning in the evening hours, uh, which uh, you will find, uh, which kicks in after 10 o'clock, and there will be no pre-planned single staffing uh, after eight o'clock, which means between eight and 10, if, heaven forfend, a staff member would fall ill or something of that sort, the premises would not automatically need to close, but they would if that happened after 10 o'clock. But to impose double manning on a small high street, anything, off license shop, betting office, anywhere in Hare Hills, I can guarantee you uh, that that would be uh, stringently resisted and it's not necessary in this particular case. Uh, and so far as uh, I think probably what has given rise to that is that your officers have insufficiently analysed how many people go in to these premises. It seems to be founded on the proposition if there's 30 seats, there might be half the, that number in the premises at any one time. That will not happen. And if it were to happen, my client would be uh, double staffing itself without the need for a licence condition on the point. So if we ever had to go elsewhere with this, we would just produce evidence of numbers in all of its premises in Leeds. And nobody is going to think you've got to have two staff members in at all times of uh, day and evening. So far as SIA staff is concerned, I make exactly the same point. I, it's, it, with respect, it's absolutely remarkable that you've got this consistent evidence that all your betting officers or at least some of them, have got real problems with street drinkers and crime levels and all of that sort of thing. But nobody suggested that there should be SIA staff there. There are no SIA, SIA staff there. But here you have an operator with a different model saying to you with evidence that they don't give rise to problems. And it's being suggested that you need to have paid door staff outside. If you wanted to kill the operation again, that would be the way to do it. Um, but it wouldn't be acceptable um, because it is not necessary. Uh, I again say my client has never had a review 
uh, at all, let alone a review which has suggested there needs to be a condition about SIA, and this would simply be discriminatory of uh, one sector against the other. If, however, and I say this for the last time, problems emerge which suddenly meant there needs to be SIA door staff in, my client will be the first person to put them in to solve that problem because it does not want a reputation anywhere in its estate of problems and it doesn't want a local community to think that of it. So that's what I'm say about conditions. Can I just finally um, very say- Very quick on the final bit. Very fine, very, very quickly. Page um, 74. Uh, deals with how this test works and it's a matter of primary obligation to grant a license when certain matters are fulfilled. Those certain matters are, is this in accordance with the code of practice? Answer, yes it is. I would ask you to make a finding of that. Is it in accordance with relevant guidance by the Camberling Commission? Uh, yes it is and again I ask you to make a finding in relation to that. Is it reasonably consistent with the licensing objectives? Bearing in mind this is subject to A and B above. Yes, with all of these conditions, it is reasonably consistent. If you never want problem gambling, you don't allow any establishments to open. All that is needed is reasonable consistency. And there clearly is from its track record around the country and its response here. And is it in accordance with your statement of licensing policy? Yes, it is. And there's nothing in your policy that says there are areas in Leeds where gambling, even of good operators with good conditions, uh, should simply be refused. And the height of this case is there are vulnerable people here, but that's where the case stops. What, it, what the case has not done is to demonstrate by evidence, which if you look at page 74 is what is required, demonstrate by evidence that my client has not taken reasonable steps to protect vulnerable people, and therefore it is more likely than not uh, that there will be uh, negative impacts. My client is a good partner to communities. It's well organized, it's well resourced. And if you're good enough to grant this license, uh, I can assure you that my client will work to get this right and ensure that it is a good operator uh, within this community. Thank you very much indeed. And if I've gone a bit over, I, I, um, I humbly apologize. Thank you. Okay, I mean, the, the last, points that you made there as a licensing subcommittee we are well aware of that is our duty to um, determine um, those very items and that is what we have to make our decision on and we will be doing so. Okay, um, Councillor Knight are you wishing to come in ask a few questions? Yes please Chair if I, if I may um, I, I, I'd, I'd like to get to what appears to be the crux of the matter and that is um, in relation to something you, you just mentioned, Mr. Colvin. Um, but uh, earlier on, when I was asking some questions about the, the customer gains and losses, um, I, th I think there was an admission that the company's success is based on customer loss overall. Um, now, clearly, you know, bearing in mind that this is an area of great deprivation, bearing in mind that uh, on page 327, uh, of the pack, the research refers to certain groups that are more vulnerable to gambling related harm, those being young people I think you've dealt with, adults living in constrained economic circumstances, certain minority ethnic groups, homeless people, those living in areas of greatest deprivation, adults with mental health issues, people with poorer intellectual functioning and learning disabilities, those who have been through the criminal justice process and immigrants all of those groups are within this, this particular area in which you're proposing to um, establish um, uh, um, the, the bingo. Um, can you explain again and perhaps recap what the applicant will do to ensure that their company's success is not by the exploitation of vulnerable people as defined in this list that live within the area of this particular proposed premises and of whom there are very many in this particular area. What specifically will they be doing to meet that licensing objective which protects vulnerable people in this area of whom there are many? Uh, 
I'd be, I, Councillor, I'd be really glad to do that. But can, can, can I just address the premise of, of your question um, first, wh which is that my client's success is based on making a profit from gambling activity. Um, and that's absolutely true. Um, in the same way that um, all of the risk groups that you've mentioned are also risks for alcoholism and the success of all of your local off licenses is predicated on people purchasing alcohol. Um, and, and you could easily have a national system which said you could have a prohibition system which said, well, alcohol just won't be sold. And you know what happens, of course, when, when, when you do that. And you could equally have a gambling system which says there won't be gambling or there won't be gambling for under 21s or there won't be gambling on machines. And all democracies have got different ways of dealing with this. Um, the way our democracy deals with this is to say that gambling is a legitimate retail activity and which works on making profit from people. Um, and what is required is that those who are purveying that activity have to do so in a way uh, which meets the regulatory objectives of the legislation. And that would apply to alcohol and, and other forms of uh, licensed activity too. Uh, there was a realization under the Gambling Act that it's not enough necessarily for operators just to observe national standards. So the national standards here are in the LCCPs and the mandatory and default conditions. It wanted more. And my client brings a lot more in the way that it runs its operation, which we've set out in these 400 pages, which I'm very grateful to people to read. But more recently, the Gambling Commission has pointed out that there'll be some areas which are more vulnerable than other areas. And that's what you've just done. This area is more vulnerable than other areas. And so as a result, uh, what's required of the operator is not just to come along and say, oh, we're perfect. Doesn't matter whether it's Hare Hills or Knightsbridge, you know, the controls are all exactly the same. The operator's got to, got to research and demonstrate an understanding of the local area and then put in place appropriate measures to respond to those vulnerabilities. And the appropriate measures that um, my, my, my client has put in um, are set out at page, um, pages 304 to 306, which are the 35 further conditions. But there's also other measures which aren't even in the conditions, things like the Playwright app, and the responsible gambling messaging on machines, which is a process which has been developed after research and together with GamCare, the industry was supposed to have rolled this out entirely, but because of COVID it hasn't, but my client has, and has not just done it on the category B machines, which the industry research is talking about, it's putting it on all of its machines. So it's already going above and beyond. But so far then as the, the, as the legal obligations it's taking upon itself are concerned, those are set out in long form at pages 304 to 306. And then I've tried to summarize them competently for you at pages eight, nine um, uh, and 10. Um, of my skeleton argument um, and uh, where we've set out the further conditions which my client is prepared to take on itself in recognition of the fact that a larger proportion than normal of its customers will be vulnerable. Now there'll be some areas and my client has made many 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 applications uh, in recent years where the percentage of vulnerable people is I'm taking for the sake of argument two percent so one in 50 of its customers are coming in vulnerable and my client has got um, mechanisms in place to try to recognize that and deal with it appropriately and sensitively. In other areas, it might be 6%. In other areas, it might be 10%. But the processes that my client has to uh, put in place uh, mean that it's got to be the more alert because rather than one in 50 of its customers uh, coming in who may be vulnerable, it may be one in 10, it may be one in eight. And what my client has to do is through its compliance team and through its learning, through its independent audit, ensure that, that all that can be done to protect vulnerable people is being done, recognizing that the, for the majority of people, gambling is just a leisure activity uh, and can be done without any 
cause of concern ex in exactly the same way as with alcohol. Most people handle their alcohol, some don't. And so premises have to put in place measures to deal with that. And so the measures we've put in place are page 304 to 306, uh, on pages 8 to 10, on top of the legal obligations in the LCCP mandatory and default, and on top of the corporate processes, which have been the subject of admiration by licensing subcommittees and officers uh, up and down the land. Thank you. I'm sure we'll play, um, pay close consideration to the you. uh, pages that you've referenced. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Latty, is there any questions you'd like to ask at this point? No, no. OK, thank you. I have a few to ask. Um, in the uh, pack, um, it says um, uh, on page 29, um, local police currently li liaising with local police licensing team recording, uh, regarding operational proposals. Um, that's still sort of highlighting as highlighted as um, being um, incomplete. And I just wondered if you had any comments to make on that. That's question one. Question two, um, we've seen that the uh, licensing department have suggested a condition of 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. And at the moment, you're only um, allowed under planning conditions to open till 11. The planning condition, as you know, is not relevant to the licensing. Um, however, I just wonder, given the concern of um, the police and local residents, that um, other establishments closing at 10 o'clock could lead to people coming into yours. Um, I accept everything that you've said about the um, conditions um, put on entry and things like that. And But is there any merit or would you be prepared to have, uh, if we were so minded, um, a, a last entry time of say 10 o'clock so that those already within the premise could continue to play bingo, could continue on the machines, but no later entry is permitted. Um, that's a suggestion that might help us if we are minded. Um, and one, one of the other concerns that I've got is this is listed as a, a bingo premise, um, predominantly. Um, now, I, at a younger age, was certainly, when I went to the seaside, went into bingo Halls and there were lots of people playing. Um, you say that you're only expecting uh, potentially, say, five customers at a time. How do you play bingo with five? Is it that it's with other premises or is it, you know, because if there's only five of you or there's only two people playing bingo, you're going to win every time. So how does that work? Um, I'm sure there is a, just, as I'm talking, I've just realised it's probably that it's uh, perhaps an online bingo with other things. But if you could just clarify that, and to how, how you feel that um, the mix between bingo and gaming machines will play out um, within the establishment. If you've only five, will they be playing bingo? Will they all be on the machines? Is it just that bingo is there to say this is bingo? Because actually the name of the establishment is Mercure Slots. And that tends to reference that it's slot machines rather than bingo. So if I could leave those few points with you to come back to me on, please. Sure, sir. Thank you. Um, the first question was about liaison with police licensing. Um, that um, uh, is dealt with at page 253, paragraph 11 of our bundle. Um, and this is Amanda Kiernan. For the purposes of the current application, the local police licensing team were initially consulted throughout May to July but unfortunately no response was received to our inquiries. Um, I, all I would say about that is that my client would love to deal with the, poli with the police licensing team if this license is granted. Um, those relationships are extremely important. And it may well be one of the things which happened here, Sergeant Winster has got a general concern here about crime and disorder, whereas a police licensing team is sometimes 
a little bit pragmatic about whether individual premises might do this or that to um, ensure that they're not going to be a problem locally. So my client has tried, has also tried, has always tried, tries everywhere. Um, in nearly all cases, it ends up with a very good dialogue. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. It's not a criticism. It's COVID. Everyone's busy and flying around and so forth. Um, but my client is very much into these local relationships. Um, secondly, last entry 10. I mean, I, I would say in general, I know you, you're absolutely right that planning is not relevant, but it's, it's, it's just a fact that those are the legally binding hours on my, on my client's um, premises anyway, um, whatever you do. Um, my client's suggestion in relation to last entry, of course, you can make uh, orders, I mean, by, by way of condition, but the suggestion that we would make is that my client would be prepared to put the maglock on after 10 p.m. And that would mean that anybody who wanted to get in after 10 would have to ask to be admitted and then would be checked on a video entry system and then um, permitted to ent enter if if they were regarded as suitable and not if they were not regarded as suitable. So I hope that that would be a, a suitable compromise on that point to guard against what I've said to you is a very unlikely occurrence is that people tip out of betting offices uh, into bingo premises. They're just different environments, different gender splits, different atmospheres and no event, no horse racing taking place on the screens and no bets to put on on virtual dogs and all of that sort of thing. Um, but anyway, I, I hope that would be an acceptable solution. But I can see that you want to have, a, if you're going to grant the license, you want to have a think about those hours. So please have a think about what my client has got by way of planning anyway, and think about the, the maglock suggestion as well. So far as um, the, the nature of the premises are concerned, um, the, the, the reason that my client wants a bingo license is it wants bingo to happen. If it didn't want bingo to happen, it would have uh, applied for an adult gaming centre. The machine entitlement is exactly the same in an adult gaming centre as it is in a bingo premises. No limit on number of machines, but 20, only 20% of them can be category B3 machines. So it's exactly the same sort of premises. What the extra over entitlement you get with bingo is that you're entitled to provide bingo. Uh, and it, what, the, what, what is struck you is as so is two things the one would it primarily be bingo there used to be a rule in the license conditions and codes of practice called um, primary gambling activity whereby uh, you used to have to show that your the thing you were licensed for e.g here bingo uh, would be the primary activity but after um, a, a lot of public debate on the topic, the Gambling Commission changed its rule uh, to, uh, we can find this on page 201, to a rule that to have a bingo license, you have to provide substantive facilities for bingo. So there's no law or co code of practice about the order of priority between machines and bingo. And you can see why that would be. We all used to dash around boroughs counting the number of people in particular premises and how many were on machines and how many were at the betting counter and so on. And it was just ridiculous. So the Gambling Commission got rid of it. You simply have to provide bingo in premises where you're licensed for it. So far as the bingo is concerned, so what you're remembering, and I used to um, rather enjoy calling, um, was um, large bingo games, which was effectively equal chance gaming where 100 or 200 people were playing against each other and the first person to call house, uh, somebody would run over and check their card and then they would win. Um, the way these machines work is there's two different sorts of uh, games. Uh, there's games which are played with other people, not necessarily in the same premises and perhaps rarely in the same premises, which are, are called national games, where you're linked up with people doing the same thing in other places. But there's also games which are just offered on the tablet itself, which are not online. You, uh, effectively, the definition of bingo is a lottery played as a game. So balls are generated with numbers. The card is populated. And if at the end of the game you've got your line or you've got your card, then you win the game. And that means that you're able to play bingo 
just by yourself. Essentially, numbers are called and you see at the end of the game whether you've won the game. So that's how the tablets worked as an, as an amalgam of those two, two different ways of playing bingo. So just to just to so I've got it fully correctly in my head. If you were playing a solo game of bingo, you'd get a random generation of numbers for your card. And what would happen then is a series of random numbers were generated, um, but a limited a finite number. And if you got to the end of that finite number and you hadn't completed your card, you've lost. Is you put correct? it perfectly. Thank you. It's just so I understand what your in, your client's intention for the type of um, facilities offered. Absolutely. And can I say those games also have to go through a, a, a process of technical approval by the Gambling Commission. And uh, does your client have the opportunity to set the payout um, percentages on those machines or are they set by regulation and unchangeable? Hmm. I don't know. I suspect that there's a technical standard about this. I think the person I need to ask, I don't want to make this up, is Andy Tipple, who'll definitely be yeah. an authority on this topic. Our bingo is is the, the state of prizes are set by Wexel. We don't have no manipulation of uh, the uh, odds on, on the bingo game. Thank you for that. Because I'm aware that historically pub um, um, slot machines, the uh, they could be set up for different uh, payouts. And so typically uh, my understanding was from a, uh, somebody that had one is that when they got a new machine in, they'd set it high and then ramp it down so that uh, gradually people would win less once oh. they got hooked. Now, uh, that may not be part of the industry anymore, but this was certainly around many years back. Can we just ask Andy to answer? I mean, I know you've got uh, to tell people what the percentage is, but could, could, with this idea that you just make it more difficult to tempt people in and then raptured them up, can you just... No, that's not the case. Oh, that? Sorry, yeah, I was referring to bingo. Obviously, Wexel set the, the limits on bingo. Uh, all our digital game offering, the uh, return to player, the percentage is displayed on screen. So, so yes, there is a slight... You could change from... It, it's 88, 90, 92%, but that is always displayed on the cabinet as well. So we, we don't change any of the percentage settings once the cabinet goes in there. It maintains that percentage, it's displayed on the screen. So that is really from yesteryear referring to on the, on the pub side of things. Thank you. And just, just for clarification in my own mind as to exactly the activities that are going on and the controls that uh, the client has. Okay, are there any further questions from my colleagues on the panel. If not, then we will now move into private session to deliberate on the application. Could I ask that all parties, including the applicant and their representative and the licensing officer remain available should the subcommittee have any additional questions? And if there are, we will be, you'll be invited back into the meeting. So basically what it is, is we're gonna go and have an initial um, conversation about this and if we feel that we do between us need any further information, we will come back um, before then going away and making our final decision. So do we just sign out now with all of us who aren't involved in that? Do we just leave the meeting? Um, if, you, if you feel that you've said everything and that you, um, all it means is if we suddenly come up with a question that we would like to raise with you and you're not there, we can't then raise it. It's more okay. it's more relevant for the applicants, really, um, and the uh, people like the licensing authority, because it may be that we come up with something which may require further investigation. And we'll only know that when the three of us are able to communicate with ourselves. So we're going to go to a breakout room. So you're free to, to go if you feel that you've said everything um, or if you wish to stay around we will then report back to let you know whether we need any further information from anybody. Thank you. Okay thank you chair so members are now going to go into a private breakout room and if I can ask people to stay on the line if there's any further questioning thank you.
Okay, Chair. I think everybody's back in now if you want to carry on. Thank you. And uh, apologies for the delay. Um, as you'll probably appreciate, the, there's an awful lot of uh, things to consider within this application, and we want to make sure that uh, we consider everything that's been put before us. Uh, there's just a couple of um, questions I'd like to um, put uh, to uh, uh, Mr. Colvin. Um, one is in your, uh, it was either your submission or your summary, you uh, alluded to the when, when actually in the summary, when the licensing authority said um, about the potential of six additional conditions, conditions two and three relating to staffing levels, um, you said that they would be um, disproportionate, etc., because others in the area don't have them. However, you did say when 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 asked about the fact that uh, there would be a potential uh, single crewing for much of the day, um, but you would then. Um, assess that um, if you have the license granted you would assess that over a period of time to see whether additional staffing was needed at various times would you be uh, therefore um, if we were minded to grant would you be um, agreeable to a condition that would say um, that that audit should be undertaken say on a um, quarterly basis and shared with the licensing authority which would therefore tell us the um, level of um, customers that you have within your premise so that um, that audit and risk assessment is done, uh, shared, and so that we can ensure that there is a, a suitable uh, staffing level. That's one question. And the second question is, um, we're mindful of the fact that um, the licensing authority also have requested a terminal hour of 10 p.m. Um, however, you have uh, said that your, your application still stands at 10 uh, until 12 midnight um, and we, we are concerned around this point um, and given that your planning is until 11pm uh, whilst it is not a factor for our consideration um, would you be minded to uh, uh, bearing in mind that you said that you would operate legally um, to operate legally would mean a terminal hour of 11pm um, would you be um, minded to accept that as a condition if we are so disposed to grant a license? So they are the, the two questions. You'll need to turn your microphone on. Most people don't like barristers speaking, but uh, I can see it's needed here. The answer to both questions is yes. Okay, thank you for that. And thank you everyone for your attendance. Um, I, there are no further questions that we need to ask. And so that concludes the business for today. You will be informed of our decision within five working days. Thank you very much for attending. At this point, I would normally say safe journey home, but I can see that many of you are already there. So uh, I wish you all the best for the rest.